This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Read by John Greenman. Alonzo Fitz and Other Stories by Mark Twain. Chapter 1. The Loves of Alonzo Fitz Clarence and Rosanna Ethelton. It was well along in the forenoon of a bitter winter's day. The town of Eastport in the state of Maine lay buried under a deep snow that was newly fallen. The customary bustle in the streets was wanting. One could look long distances down them and see nothing but a dead-white emptiness, with silence to match. Of course, I do not mean that you could see the silence. No, you could only hear it. The sidewalks were merely long, deep ditches, with steep snow-walls on either side. Here and there you might hear the faint, far scrape of a wooden shovel, and if you were quick enough you might catch a glimpse of a distant black figure stooping and disappearing in one of those ditches, and reappearing the next moment with a motion which you would know meant the heaving out of a shovelful of snow. But you needed to be quick, for that black figure would not linger but would soon drop that shovel and scud for the house, thrashing itself with its arms to warm them. Yes, it was too venomously cold for snow-shovelers, or anybody else, to stay out long. Presently the sky darkened, then the wind rose and began to blow in fitful, vigorous gusts, which sent clouds of powdery snow aloft, and straight ahead, and everywhere. Under the impulse of one of these gusts, great white drifts banked themselves like graves across the streets. A moment later another gust shifted them around the other way, driving a fine spray of snow from their sharp crests, as the gale drives the spume flakes from wave crests at sea. A third gust swept that place as clean as your hand, if it saw fit. This was fooling, this was play, but each and all of the gusts dumped some snow into the sidewalk ditches, for that was business. Alonzo Fitz Clarence was sitting in his snug and elegant little parlor, in a lovely blue silk dressing-gown, with cuffs and facings of crimson satin, elaborately quilted. The remains of his breakfast were before him, and the dainty and costly little table-service added a harmonious charm to the grace, beauty, and richness of the fixed appointments of the room. A cheery fire was blazing on the hearth, a furious gust of wind shook the windows, and a great wave of snow washed against them with a drenching sound, so to speak. The handsome young bachelor murmured, "'That means no going out to-day. Well, I am content. But what to do for company? Mother is well enough. Aunt Susan is well enough. But these, like the poor, I have with me always.' On so grim a day as this, one needs a new interest, a fresh element, to wet the dull edge of captivity. That was very neatly said, but it doesn't mean anything. One doesn't want the edge of captivity sharpened up, you know, but just the reverse. He glanced at his pretty French mantel clock. That clock's wrong again. That clock hardly ever knows what time it is, and when it does know it lies about it, which amounts to the same thing. Alfred? There was no answer. Alfred! Good servant, but as uncertain as the clock. Alonzo touched an electric bell button in the wall. He waited a moment, then touched it again, waited a few moments more, and said, Battery out of order, no doubt, but now that I have started, I will find out what time it is. He stepped to a speaking tube in the wall, blew its whistle, and called, Mother! and repeated it twice. Well, that's no use. Mother's battery is out of order, too. Can't raise anybody downstairs, that is plain. He sat down at a rosewood desk, leaned his chin on the left-hand edge of it, and spoke as if to the floor. Aunt Susan? A low, pleasant voice answered, Is that you, Alonzo? Yes. I'm too lazy and comfortable to go downstairs. I am in extremity, and I can't seem to scare up any help. Dear me, what is the matter? Matter enough, I can tell you. Oh, don't keep me in suspense, dear. What is it? I want to know what time it is. Oh, you abominable boy! What a turn you did give me! Is that all? All, on my honor. Calm yourself. Tell me the time, and receive my blessing. Just five minutes after nine. No charge. Keep your blessing. Thanks. 
it wouldn't have impoverished me auntie nor so enriched you that you could live without other means he got up murmuring just five minutes after nine and faced his clock ah said he you are doing better than usual you are only thirty-four minutes wrong let me see let me see thirty-three and twenty-one are fifty-four four times fifty-four are two hundred and thirty-six one off leaves two hundred and thirty-five that's right he turned the hands of his clock forward till they marked twenty-five minutes to one and said now see if you can't keep right for a while else i'll raffle you he sat down at the desk again and said aunt susan yes dear had breakfast yes indeed an hour ago busy no except sewing why got any company no but i expect some at half past nine i wish i did i'm lonesome i want to talk to somebody very well talk to me but this is very private don't be afraid talk right along there's nobody here but me i hardly know whether to venture or not but but what oh don't stop there you know you can trust me alonzo you know you can i feel it aunt but this is very serious it affects me deeply me and all the family even the whole community oh alonzo tell me i will never breathe a word of it what is it aunt if i might dare oh please go on i love you and feel for you tell me all confide in me what is it the weather plague take the weather i don't see how you can have the heart to serve me so long there there auntie dear i'm sorry i am on my honor i won't do it again do you forgive me yes since you seem so sincere about it though i know i oughtn't to you will fool me again as soon as i have forgotten this time no i won't honor bright but such weather oh such weather you've got to keep your spirits up artificially it is snowy and blowy and gusty and bitter cold how is the weather with you warm and rainy and melancholy the mourners go about the streets with their umbrellas running streams from the end of every whalebone there's an elevated double pavement of umbrellas stretching down the sides of the streets as far as i can see i've got a fire for cheerfulness and the windows open to keep cool but it is vain it is useless nothing comes in but the balmy breath of december with its burden of mocking odors from the flowers that possess the realm outside and rejoice in their lawless profusions whilst the spirit of man is low and flaunt their gaudy splendors in his face while his soul is clothed in sackcloth and ashes and his heart breaketh alonzo opened his lips to say you ought to print that and get it framed but checked himself for he heard his aunt speaking to some one else he went and stood at the window and looked out upon the wintry prospect the storm was driving the snow before it more furiously than ever window shutters were slamming and banging a forlorn dog with bowed head and tail withdrawn from service was pressing his quaking body against a windward wall for shelter and protection a young girl was ploughing knee-deep through the drifts with her face turned from the blast and the cape of her waterproof blowing straight rearward over her head alonzo shuddered and said with a sigh better the slop and the sultry rain and even the insolent flowers than this he turned from the window moved a step and stopped in a listening attitude the faint sweet notes of a familiar song caught his ear he remained there with his head unconsciously bent forward drinking in the melody stirring neither hand nor foot hardly breathing there was a blemish in the execution of the song but to alonzo it seemed an added charm instead of a defect this blemish consisted of a marked flatting of the third fourth fifth sixth and seventh notes of the refrain or chorus of the piece when the music ended alonzo drew a deep breath and said ah i never have heard in the sweet by and by sung like that before he stepped quickly to the desk listened a moment and said in a guarded confidential voice auntie who is this divine singer she is the company i was expecting stays with me a month or two i will introduce you miss for goodness sakes wait a moment aunt susan you never stop to think what you are about 
he flew to his bedchamber and returned in a moment perceptibly changed in his outward appearance and remarking snappishly hang it she would have introduced me to this angel in that sky-blue dressing-gown and red-hot lapels women never think when they get a-going he hastened and stood by the desk and said eagerly now auntie i am ready and fell to smiling and bowing with all the persuasiveness and elegance that were in him very well miss rosanna ethelton let me introduce to you my favorite nephew mr alonzo fitz clarence there you are both good people and i like you so i am going to trust you together while i attend to a few household affairs sit down rosanna sit down alonzo good-bye i shan't be gone long alonzo had been bowing and smiling all the while and motioning imaginary young ladies to sit down in imaginary chairs but now he took a seat himself mentally saying oh this is luck let the winds blow now and the snow drive and the heavens frown little i care while these young people chat themselves into acquaintanceship let us take the liberty of inspecting the sweeter and fairer of the two she sat alone at her graceful ease in a richly furnished apartment which was manifestly the private parlor of a refined and sensible lady if signs and symbols may go for anything for instance by a low comfortable chair stood a dainty top-heavy workstand whose summit was a fancifully embroidered shallow basket with vari-colored crewels and other strings and odds and ends protruding from under the gaping lid and hanging down in negligent profusion on the floor lay bright shreds of turkey red prussian blue and kindred fabrics bits of ribbon a spool or two a pair of scissors and a roll or so of tinted silken stuffs on a luxurious sofa in color lay a great square of coarse white stuff upon whose surface a rich bouquet of flowers was growing under the deft cultivation of the crochet needle the household cat was asleep on this work of art in a bay window stood an easel with an unfinished picture on it and a palette and brushes on a chair beside it there were books everywhere robertson's sermons tennyson moody and sankey hawthorne rab and his friends cook-books prayer-books pattern-books and books about all kinds of odious and exasperating pottery of course there was a piano with a deck-load of music and more in a tender there was a great plenty of pictures on the walls on the shelves of the mantelpiece and around generally where coins of vantage offered were statuettes and quaint and pretty gimcracks and rare and costly specimens of peculiarly devilish china the bay window gave upon a garden that was ablaze with foreign and domestic flowers and flowering shrubs but the sweet young girl was the daintiest thing these premises within or without could offer for contemplation delicately chiselled features of grecian cast her complexion the pure snow of a japonica that is receiving a faint reflected enrichment from some scarlet neighbor of the garden great soft blue eyes fringed with long curving lashes an expression made up of the truthfulness of a child and the gentleness of a fawn a beautiful head crowned with its own prodigal gold a lithe and rounded figure whose every attitude and movement was instinct with native grace her dress and adornment were marked by that exquisite harmony that can come only of a fine natural taste perfected by culture her gown was of a simple magenta tulle cut bias traversed by three rows of light blue flounces with the selvage edges turned up with ashes of roses chenille overdress of dark bay tartlin with scarlet satin lambrequins corn-colored polonaise en panier looped with mother-of-pearl buttons and silver cord and hauled aft and made fast by buff velvet lashings basque of lavender reps picked out with valenciennes low neck short sleeves maroon velvet necktie edged with delicate pink silk inside handkerchief of some simple three-ply ingrain fabric of a soft saffron tint coral bracelets and locket chain coiffure of forget-me-nots and lilies of the valley massed around a noble cala this was all yet even in this subdued attire she was divinely beautiful then what must she have been when adorned for the festival or the ball all this time she had been busily chatting with alonzo unconscious of our inspection 
the minutes still sped and still she talked but by and by she happened to look up and saw the clock a crimson blush sent its rich flood through her cheeks and she exclaimed there good-bye mr fitz clarence i must go now she sprang from her chair with such haste that she hardly heard the young man's answering good-bye she stood radiant graceful beautiful and gazed wondering upon the accusing clock presently her pouting lips parted and she said five minutes after eleven nearly two hours and it did not seem twenty minutes oh dear what will he think of me at the selfsame moment alonzo was staring at his clock and presently he said twenty-five minutes to three nearly two hours and i didn't believe it was two minutes is it possible that this clock is humbugging again miss ethelton uh, just one moment please are you there yet yes but be quick i'm going right away would you be so kind as to tell me what time it is the girl blushed again murmured to herself it's right down cruel of him to ask me and then spoke up and answered with admirably counterfeited unconcern five minutes after eleven oh thank you you have to go now have you i'm sorry no reply miss ethelton well you you're there yet ain't you yes but please hurry what did you want to say well i well nothing in particular it's very lonesome here it's asking a great deal i know but would you mind talking with me again by and by that is if it will not trouble you too much i don't know but i'll think about it i'll try oh thanks uh, miss ethelton ah me she's gone and here are the black clouds and the whirling snow and the raging winds come again but she said good-bye she didn't say good morning she said good-bye the clock was right after all what a lightning-winged two hours it was he sat down and gazed dreamily into his fire for a while then heaved a sigh and said how wonderful it is two little hours ago i was a free man and now my heart's in san francisco about that time rosanna ethelton propped in the window-seat of her bedchamber book in hand was gazing vacantly out over the rainy seas that washed the golden gate and whispering to herself how different he is from poor burley with his empty head and his single little antic talent of mimicry two four weeks later mr sidney algernon burley was entertaining a gay luncheon company in a sumptuous drawing-room on telegraph hill with some capital imitations of the voices and gestures of certain popular actors and san franciscan literary people and bonanza grandees he was elegantly upholstered and was a handsome fellow barring a trifling cast in his eye he seemed very jovial but nevertheless he kept his eye on the door with an expectant and uneasy watchfulness by and by a knobby lackey appeared and delivered a message to the mistress who nodded her head understandingly that seemed to settle the thing for mr burley his vivacity decreased little by little and a dejected look began to creep into one of his eyes and a sinister one into the other the rest of the company departed in due time leaving him with the mistress to whom he said there is no longer any question about it she avoids me she continually accuses herself if i could see her if i could speak to her only a moment but this suspense perhaps her seeming avoidance is mere accident mr burley go to the small drawing-room upstairs and amuse yourself a moment i will dispatch a household order that is on my mind and then i will go to her room without doubt she will be persuaded to see you mr burley went upstairs intending to go to the small drawing-room but as he was passing aunt susan's private parlor the door of which stood slightly ajar he heard a joyous laugh which he recognized so without knock or announcement he stepped confidently in but before he could make his presence known he heard words that harrowed up his soul and chilled his young blood he heard a voice say darling it has come then he heard rosanna ethelton whose back was toward him say so has yours dearest he saw her bowed form bent lower he heard her kiss something not merely once but again and again his soul raged within him the heart-breaking conversation went on rosanna i knew you must be beautiful but this is dazzling this is blinding this is intoxicating 
alonzo it is such happiness to hear you say it i know it is not true but i am so grateful to have you think it is nevertheless i knew you must have a noble face but the grace and majesty of the reality beggar the poor creation of my fancy burley heard that rattling shower of kisses again thank you my rosanna the photograph flatters me but you must not allow yourself to think of that sweetheart yes alonzo i am so happy rosanna oh alonzo none that have gone before me knew what love was none that come after me will ever know what happiness is i float in a gorgeous cloud land a boundless firmament of enchanted and bewildering ecstasy oh my rosanna for you are mine are you not holy oh holy yours alonzo now and for ever all the day long and all through my nightly dreams one song sings itself and its sweet burden is alonzo fitz clarence alonzo fitz clarence eastport state of maine curse him i've got his address anyway roared burley inwardly and rushed from the place just behind the unconscious alonzo stood his mother a picture of astonishment she was so muffled from head to heel in furs that nothing of herself was visible but her eyes and nose she was a good allegory of winter for she was powdered all over with snow behind the unconscious rosanna stood aunt susan another picture of astonishment she was a good allegory of summer for she was lightly clad and was vigorously cooling the perspiration on her face with a fan both of these women had tears of joy in their eyes so ho exclaimed mrs fitz clarence this explains why nobody has been able to drag you out of your room for six weeks alonzo so ho exclaimed aunt susan this explains why you have been a hermit for the past six weeks rosanna the young couple were on their feet in an instant abashed and standing like detected dealers in stolen goods awaiting judge lynch's doom bless you my son i am happy in your happiness come to your mother's arms alonzo bless you rosanna for my dear nephew's sake come to my arms then was there a mingling of hearts and of tears of rejoicing on telegraph hill and in eastport square servants were called by the elders in both places unto one was given the order pile this fire high with hickory wood and bring me a roasting hot lemonade unto the other was given the order put out this fire and bring me two palm-leaf fans and a pitcher of ice-water then the young couple were dismissed and the elders sat down to talk the sweet surprise over and make the wedding plans some minutes before this mr burley rushed from the mansion on telegraph hill without meeting or taking formal leave of anybody he hissed through his teeth in unconscious imitation of a popular favorite in melodrama him shall she never wed i have sworn it ere great nature shall have doffed her winter's ermine to don the emerald gods of spring she shall be mine three two weeks later every few hours during same three or four days a very prim and devout-looking episcopal clergyman with a cast in his eye had visited alonzo according to his card he was the rev melton hargrave of cincinnati he said he had retired from the ministry on account of his health if he had said on account of ill health he would probably have erred to judge by his wholesome looks and firm build he was the inventor of an improvement in telephones and hoped to make his bread by selling the privilege of using it at present he continued a man may go and tap a telegraph wire which is conveying a song or a concert from one state to another and he can attach his private telephone and steal a hearing of that music as it passes along my invention will stop all that well answered alonzo if the owner of the music could not miss what was stolen why should he care he shouldn't care said the reverend well said alonzo inquiringly suppose replied the reverend suppose that instead of music that was passing along and being stolen the burden of the wire was loving endearments of the most private and sacred nature alonzo shuddered from head to heel sir it is a priceless invention said he i must have it at any cost but the invention was delayed somewhere on the road from cincinnati most unaccountably the impatient alonzo could hardly wait 
the thought of rosannah's sweet words being shared with him by some ribald thief was galling to him the reverend came frequently and lamented the delay and told of measures he had taken to hurry things up this was some little comfort to alonzo one forenoon the reverend ascended the stairs and knocked at alonzo's door there was no response he entered glanced eagerly around closed the door softly then ran to the telephone the exquisitely soft and remote strains of the sweet by-and-by came floating through the instrument the singer was flatting as usual the five notes that follow the first two in the chorus when the reverend interrupted her with this word in a voice which was an exact imitation of alonzo's with just the faintest flavor of impatience added sweetheart yes alonzo please don't sing that any more this week try something modern the agile step that goes with a happy heart was heard on the stairs and the reverend smiling diabolically sought sudden refuge behind the heavy folds of the velvet window curtains alonzo entered and flew to the telephone said he rosanna dear shall we sing something together something modern asked she with sarcastic bitterness yes if you prefer sing it yourself if you like this snappishness amazed and wounded the young man he said rosanna that was not like you i suppose it becomes me as much as your very polite speech became you mr fitz clarence mr fitz clarence rosanna there was nothing impolite about my speech oh indeed of course then i misunderstood you and i most humbly beg your pardon <laughs> no doubt you said don't sing it any more to-day sing what any more to-day the song you mentioned of course how very obtuse we are all of a sudden i never mentioned any song oh you didn't no i didn't i am compelled to remark that you did and i am obliged to reiterate that i didn't a second rudeness that is sufficient sir i will never forgive you all is over between us then came a muffled sound of crying alonzo hastened to say oh rosanna unsay those words there is some dreadful mystery here some hideous mistake i am utterly earnest and sincere when i say i never said anything about any song i would not hurt you for the whole world rosanna dear speak to me won't you there was a pause then alonzo heard the girl's sobbings retreating and knew she had gone from the telephone he rose with a heavy sigh and hastened from the room saying to himself i will ransack the charity missions and the haunts of the poor for my mother she will persuade her that i never meant to wound her a minute later the reverend was crouching over the telephone like a cat that knoweth the ways of the prey he had not very many minutes to wait a soft repentant voice tremulous with tears said alonzo dear i have been wrong you could not have said so cruel a thing it must have been some one who imitated your voice in malice or in jest the reverend coldly answered in alonzo's tones you have said all was over between us so let it be i spurn your proffered repentance and despise it then he departed radiant with fiendish triumph to return no more with his imaginary telephonic invention forever four hours afterward alonzo arrived with his mother from her favorite haunts of poverty and vice they summoned the san francisco household but there was no reply they waited and continued to wait upon the voiceless telephone at length when it was sunset in san francisco and three hours and a half after dark in eastport an answer to the oft-repeated cry of rosanna but alas it was aunt susan's voice that spake she said i have been out all day just got in i will go and find her the watchers waited two minutes five minutes ten minutes then came these fatal words in a frightened tone she is gone and her baggage with her to visit another friend she told the servants but i found this note on the table in her room listen i am gone seek not to trace me out my heart is broken you will never see me more tell him i shall always think of him when i sing my poor sweet by and by but never of the unkind words he said about it that is her note Al alonzo alonzo what does it mean what has happened but alonzo sat white and cold as the dead his mother threw back the velvet curtains and opened a window the cold air refreshed the sufferer and he told his aunt his dismal story 
meantime his mother was inspecting a card which had disclosed itself upon the floor when she cast the curtains back it read mr sidney algernon burley san francisco this miscreant shouted alonzo and rushed forth to seek the false reverend and destroy him for the card explained everything since in the course of the lovers mutual confessions they had told each other all about all the sweethearts they had ever had and thrown no end of mud at their failings and foibles for lovers always do that it has a fascination that ranks next after billing and cooing four during the next two months many things happened it had early transpired that rosanna poor suffering orphan had neither returned to her grandmother in portland oregon nor sent any word to her save a duplicate of the woeful note she had left in the mansion on telegraph hill whosoever was sheltering her if she was still alive had been persuaded not to betray her whereabouts without doubt for all efforts to find trace of her had failed did alonzo give her up not he he said to himself she will sing that sweet song when she is sad i shall find her so he took his carpet-sack and a portable telephone and shook the snow of his native city from his arctics and went forth into the world he wandered far and wide and in many states time and again strangers were astounded to see a wasted pale and woe-worn man laboriously climb a telegraph pole in wintry and lonely places perch sadly there an hour with his ear at a little box then come sighing down and wander wearily away sometimes they shot at him as peasants do at aeronauts thinking him mad and dangerous thus his clothes were much shredded by bullets and his person grievously lacerated but he bore it all patiently in the beginning of his pilgrimage he used often to say ah if i could but hear the sweet by and by but toward the end of it he used to shed tears of anguish and say ah if i could but hear something else thus a month and three weeks drifted by and at last some humane people seized him and confined him in a private madhouse in new york he made no moan for his strength was all gone and with it all heart and all hope the superintendent in pity gave up his own comfortable parlor and bedchamber to him and nursed him with affectionate devotion at the end of a week the patient was able to leave his bed for the first time he was lying comfortably pillowed on a sofa listening to the plaintive miserere of the bleak march winds and the muffled sound of tramping feet in the street below for it was about six in the evening and new york was going home from work he had a bright fire and the added cheer of a couple of student lamps so it was warm and snug within though bleak and raw without it was light and bright within though outside it was as dark and dreary as if the world had been lit with hartford gas alonzo smiled feebly to think how his loving vagaries had made him a maniac in the eyes of the world and was proceeding to pursue his line of thought further when a faint sweet strain the very ghost of sound so remote and attenuated it seemed struck upon his ear his pulses stood still he listened with parted lips and bated breath the song flowed on he waited listening rising slowly and unconsciously from his recumbent position at last he exclaimed it is it is she oh the divine hated notes he dragged himself eagerly to the corner whence the sounds proceeded tore aside a curtain and discovered a telephone he bent over and as the last note died away he burst forth with the exclamation oh thank heaven found at last speak to me rosanna dearest the cruel mystery has been unraveled it was the villain burley who mimicked my voice and wounded you with insolent speech there was a breathless pause a waiting age to alonzo then a faint sound came framing itself into language oh say those precious words again alonzo they are the truth the veritable truth my rosanna and you shall have the proof ample and abundant proof oh alonzo stay by me leave me not for a moment let me feel that you are near me tell me we shall never be parted more oh this happy hour this blessed hour this memorable hour we will make a record of it my rosanna every year as this dear hour chimes from the clock we will celebrate it with thanksgiving all the years of our life 
we will we will alonzo four minutes after six in the evening my rosanna shall henceforth twenty-three minutes after twelve afternoon shall why rosanna darling where are you in honolulu sandwich islands and where are you stay by me do not leave me for a moment i cannot bear it are you at home no dear i am in new york a patient in the doctor's hands an agonizing shriek came buzzing to alonzo's ear like the sharp buzzing of a hurt gnat it lost power in traveling five thousand miles alonzo hastened to say calm yourself my child it is nothing already i am getting well under the sweet healing of your presence rosanna yes alonzo oh how you terrified me say on name the happy day rosanna there was a little pause then a different small voice replied i blush but it is with pleasure it is with happiness would would you like to have it soon this very night rosanna oh let us risk no more delays let it be now this very night this very moment oh you impatient creature i have nobody here but my good old uncle a missionary for a generation and now retired from service nobody but him and his wife i would so dearly like it if your mother and your aunt susan our mother and our aunt susan my rosanna yes our mother and our aunt susan i am content to word it so if it pleases you i would so like to have them present so would i suppose you telegraph aunt susan how long would it take her to come the steamer leaves san francisco day after tomorrow the passage is eight days she would be here the thirty-first of march then name the first of april do rosanna dear mercy it would make us april fools alonzo so we be the happiest ones that that day's suit looks down upon in the whole broad expanse of the globe why need we care call it the first of april dear then the first of april it shall be with all my heart oh happiness name the hour too rosanna i like the morning it is so blithe will eight in the morning do alonzo the loveliest hour in the day since it will make you mine there was a feeble but frantic sound for some little time as if wool-lipped disembodied spirits were exchanging kisses then rosanna said excuse me just a moment dear i have an appointment and am called to meet it the young girl sought a large parlor and took her place at a window which looked out upon a beautiful scene to the left one could view the charming nuana valley fringed with its ruddy flush of tropical flowers and its plumed and graceful cocoa palms its rising foothills clothed in the shining green of lemon citron and orange groves its storied precipice beyond where the first kamehameha drove his defeated foes over to their destruction a spot that had forgotten its grim history no doubt for now it was smiling as almost always at noonday under the glowing arches of a succession of rainbows in front of the window one could see the quaint town and here and there a picturesque group of dusky natives enjoying the blistering weather and far to the right lay the restless ocean tossing its white mane in the sunshine rosanna stood there in her filmy white raiment fanning her flushed and heated face waiting a kanaka boy clothed in a damaged blue necktie and part of a silk hat thrust his head in at the door and announced frisco howley show him up said the girl straightening herself up and assuming a meaning dignity mr sidney algernon burley entered clad from head to heel in dazzling snow that is to say in the lightest and whitest of irish linen he moved eagerly forward but the girl made a gesture and gave him a look which checked him suddenly she said coldly i am here as i promised i believed your assertions i yielded to your importune lies and said i would name the day i name the first of april eight in the morning now go oh my dearest if the gratitude of a lifetime not a word spare me all sight of you all communication with you until that hour no no supplications i will have it so when he was gone she sank exhausted in a chair for the long siege of troubles she had undergone had wasted her strength presently she said what a narrow escape if the hour appointed had been an hour earlier oh horror what an escape i have made 
and to think i had come to imagine i was loving this beguiling this truthless this treacherous monster oh he shall repent his villainy let us now draw this history to a close for little more needs to be told on the second of the ensuing april the honolulu advertiser contained this notice married in this city by telephone yesterday morning at eight o'clock by rev nathan hayes assisted by rev nathaniel davis of new york mr alonzo fitz clarence of eastport maine u s and miss rosanna ethelton of portland oregon u s mrs susan howland of san francisco a friend of the bride was present she being the guest of the rev mr hayes and wife uncle and aunt of the bride mr sidney algernon burley of san francisco was also present but did not remain till the conclusion of the marriage service captain hawthorne's beautiful yacht tastefully decorated was in waiting and the happy bride and her friends immediately departed on a bridal trip to lahaina and haleakala the new york papers of the same date contained this notice married in this city yesterday by telephone at half past two in the morning by rev nathaniel davis assisted by rev nathan hayes of honolulu mr alonzo fitz clarence of eastport maine and miss rosanna ethelton of portland oregon the parents and several friends of the bridegroom were present and enjoyed a sumptuous breakfast and much festivity until nearly sunrise and then departed on a bridal trip to the aquarium the bridegroom's state of health not admitting of a more extended journey toward the close of that memorable day mr and mrs alonzo fitz clarence were buried in sweet converse concerning the pleasures of their several bridal tours when suddenly the young wife exclaimed oh lonny i forgot i did what i said i would did you dear indeed i did i made him the april fool i told him so too ah it was a charming surprise there he stood sweltering in a black dress suit with the mercury leaking out of the top of the thermometer waiting to be married you should have seen the look he gave when i whispered it in his ear ah his wickedness cost me many a heartache and many a tear but the score was all squared up then so the vengeful feeling went right out of my heart and i begged him to stay and said i forgave him everything but he wouldn't he said he would live to be avenged said he would make our lives a curse to us but he can't can he dear never in this world my rosanna aunt susan the oregonian grandmother and the young couple and their eastport parents are all happy at this writing and likely to remain so aunt susan brought the bride from the islands accompanied her across our continent and had the happiness of witnessing the rapturous meeting between an adoring husband and wife who had never seen each other until that moment a word about the wretched burley whose wicked machinations came so near wrecking the hearts and lives of our poor young friends will be sufficient in a murderous attempt to seize a crippled and helpless artisan who he fancied had done him some small offence he fell into a cauldron alonzo fitz and other stories by mark twain chapter two on the decay of the art of lying essay for discussion read at a meeting of the historical and antiquarian club of hartford and offered for the thirty dollar prize now first published did not take the prize observe i do not mean to suggest that the custom of lying has suffered any decay or interruption no for the lie as a virtue a principle is eternal the lie as a recreation a solace a refuge in time of need the fourth grace the tenth muse man's best and surest friend is immortal and cannot perish from the earth while this club remains my complaint simply concerns the decay of the art of lying no high-handed man no man of right feeling can contemplate the lumbering and slovenly lying of the present day without grieving to see a noble art so prostituted in this veteran presence i naturally enter upon this scheme with diffidence it is like an old maid trying to teach nursery matters to the mothers in israel it would not become me to criticize you gentlemen who are nearly all my elders and my superiors in this thing 
and so, if I should here and there seem to do it, I trust it will in most cases be more in a spirit of admiration than of fault-finding. Indeed, if this finest of the fine arts had everywhere received the attention, encouragement, and conscientious practice and development which this club has devoted to it, I should not need to utter this lament or shed a single tear. I do not say this to flatter, I say it in a spirit of just and appreciative recognition. It had been my intention at this point to mention names and give illustrative specimens, but indications observable about me admonished me to beware of particulars and confine myself to generalities. No fact is more firmly established than that lying is a necessity of our circumstances. The deduction that it is then a virtue goes without saying. No virtue can reach its highest usefulness without careful and diligent cultivation. Therefore, it goes without saying that this one ought to be taught in the public schools, at the fireside, even in the newspapers. What chance has the ignorant, uncultivated liar against the educated expert? What chance have I against Mr. Purr, blank, against a lawyer? Judicious lying is what the world needs. I sometimes think it were even better and safer not to lie at all than to lie injudiciously. An awkward, unscientific lie is often as ineffectual as the truth. Now let us see what the philosophers say. Note that venerable proverb, Children and fools always speak the truth. The deduction is plain. Adults and wise persons never speak it. Parkman, the historian, says, The principle of truth may itself be carried into absurdity. In another place, in the same chapter, he says, The saying is old that truth should not be spoken at all times, and those whom a sick conscience worries into habitual violation of the maxim are imbeciles and nuisances. It is strong language, but true. None of us could live with an habitual truth-teller, but, thank goodness, none of us has to. An habitual truth-teller is simply an impossible creature. He does not exist. He never has existed. Of course, there are people who think they never lie, but it is not so, and this ignorance is one of the very things that shame our so-called civilization. Everybody lies, every day, every hour, awake, asleep, in his dreams, in his joy, in his morning. If he keeps his tongue still, his hands, his feet, his eyes, his attitude will convey deception, and purposely, even in sermons. But that is a platitude. In a far country where I once lived, the ladies used to go around paying calls under the humane and kindly pretense of wanting to see each other, and when they returned home, they would cry out with a glad voice, saying, We made sixteen calls and found fourteen of them out. Not meaning that they found out anything against the fourteen. No, that was only a colloquial phrase to signify that they were not at home, and their manner of saying it expressed their lively satisfaction in that fact. Now, their pretense of wanting to see the fourteen, and the other two whom they had been less lucky with, was that commonest and mildest form of lying which is sufficiently described as a deflection from the truth. Is it justifiable? Most certainly. It is beautiful, it is noble, for its object is not to reap profit, but to convey a pleasure to the sixteen. The iron-souled truth-monger would plainly manifest, or even utter the fact, that he didn't want to see those people, and he would be an ass, and inflict a totally unnecessary pain. And next, those ladies in that far country—but never mind, they had a thousand pleasant ways of lying that grew out of gentle impulses, and were a credit to their intelligence and an honor to their hearts. Let the particulars go. The men in that far country were liars, every one. Their mere howdy-do was a lie, 
because they didn't care how you did, except they were undertakers. To the ordinary inquirer you lied in return, for you made no conscientious diagnosis of your case, but answered at random, and usually missed it considerably. You lied to the undertaker, and said your health was failing, a wholly commendable lie, since it cost you nothing and pleased the other man. If a stranger called and interrupted you, you said with your hearty tongue, "'I'm glad to see you,' and said with your heartier soul, "'I wish you were with the cannibals, and it was dinner-time.' When he went, you said regretfully, "'Must you go?' and followed it with a "'Call again!' But you did no harm, for you did not deceive anybody nor inflict any hurt, whereas the truth would have made you both unhappy. I think that all this courteous lying is a sweet and loving art, and should be cultivated. The highest perfection of politeness is only a beautiful edifice, built from the base to the dome, of graceful and gilded forms of charitable and unselfish lying. What I bemoan is the growing prevalence of the brutal truth. Let us do what we can to eradicate it. An injurious truth has no merit over an injurious lie. Neither should ever be uttered. The man who speaks an injurious truth, lest his soul be not saved if he do otherwise, should reflect that that sort of a soul is not strictly worth saving. The man who tells a lie to help a poor devil out of trouble is one of whom the angels doubtless say, Lo, here is an heroic soul who casts his own welfare into jeopardy to succor his neighbors. Let us exalt this magnanimous liar. An injurious lie is an uncommendable thing, and so, also, and in the same degree, is an injurious truth, a fact which is recognized by the law of libel. Among other common lies, we have the silent lie, the deception which one conveys by simply keeping still and concealing the truth. Many obstinate truth-mongers indulge in this dissipation, imagining that if they speak no lie, they lie not at all. In that far country where I once lived, there was a lovely spirit, a lady whose impulses were always high and pure, and whose character answered to them. One day I was there at dinner, and remarked, in a general way, that we are all liars. She was amazed, and said, Not all! It was before Pinafore's time, so I did not make the response which would naturally follow in our day, but frankly said, Yes, all! We are all liars. There are no exceptions. She looked almost offended, and said, Why, do you include me? Certainly, I said. I think you even rank as an expert. She said, Shh! Uh, shh! Uh, the children! So the subject was changed in deference to the children's presence, and we went on talking about other things. But as soon as the young people were out of the way, the lady came warmly back to the matter, and said, I have made it the rule of my life to never tell a lie, and I have never departed from it in a single instance. I said, I don't mean the least harm or disrespect, but really you have been lying like smoke ever since I've been sitting here. It has caused me a good deal of pain, because I am not used to it. She required of me an instance, just a single instance. So I said, Well, here is the unfilled duplicate of the blank which the Oakland hospital people sent to you by the hand of the sick nurse when she came here to nurse your little nephew through his dangerous illness. This blank asks all manner of questions as to the conduct of that sick nurse. Did she ever sleep on her watch? Did she ever forget to give the medicine, and so forth and so on? You are warned to be very careful and explicit in your answers, for the welfare of the service requires that the nurses be promptly fined or otherwise punished for derelictions. You told me you were perfectly delighted with that nurse, that she had a thousand perfections and only one fault. You found you never could depend on her wrapping Johnny up half sufficiently while he waited in a chilly chair for her to rearrange the warm bed. You filled up the duplicate of this paper, and sent it back to the hospital by the hand of the nurse. How did you answer this question? 
Was the nurse at any time guilty of a negligence which was likely to result in the patient's taking cold? Come, everything is decided by a bet here in California. Ten dollars to ten cents you lied when you answered that question. She said, I didn't. I left it blank. Just so. You have told a silent lie. You have left it to be inferred that you had no fault to find in that matter. She said, Oh, was that a lie? And how could I mention her one single fault, and she is so good? It would have been cruel. I said, One ought always to lie when one can do good by it. Your impulse was right, but your judgment was crude. This comes of unintelligent practice. Now observe the result of this inexpert deflection of yours. You know, Mr. Jones Willie is lying very low with scarlet fever. Well, your recommendation was so enthusiastic that that girl is there nursing him, and the worn-out family have all been trustingly sound asleep for the last fourteen hours, leaving their darling with full confidence in those fatal hands, because you, like young George Washington, have a reputation. However, if you are not going to have anything to do, I will come around to-morrow, and will attend the funeral together, for, of course, you'll naturally feel a peculiar interest in Willie's case, as personal a one, in fact, as the undertaker. But that was all lost. Before I was halfway through, she was in a carriage and making thirty miles an hour toward the Jones mansion to save what was left of Willie and tell all she knew about the deadly nurse all of which was unnecessary, as Willie wasn't sick. I had been lying myself. But that same day, all the same, she sent a line to the hospital which filled up the neglected blank, and stated the facts, too, in the squarest possible manner. Now, you see, this lady's fault was not in lying, but only in lying injudiciously. She should have told the truth there, and made it up to the nurse with a fraudulent compliment further along in the paper. She could have said, In one respect the sick nurse is perfection. When she is on watch, she never snores. Almost any little pleasant lie would have taken the sting out of that troublesome but necessary expression of the truth. Lying is universal. We all do it. We all must do it. Therefore, the wise thing is for us diligently to train ourselves to lie thoughtfully, judiciously, to lie with a good object and not an evil one, to lie for others' advantage and not our own, to lie healingly, charitably, humanely, not cruelly, hurtfully, maliciously, to lie gracefully and graciously, not awkwardly and clumsily, to lie firmly, frankly, squarely, with head erect, not haltingly, tortuously, with pusillanimous mien, as being ashamed of our high calling. Then shall we be rid of the rank and pestilent truth that is rotting the land. Then shall we be great and good and beautiful, and worthy dwellers in a world where even benign nature habitually lies, except when she promises execrable weather. Then— but I am but a new and feeble student in this gracious art. I cannot instruct this club. Joking aside, I think there is much need of wise examination into what sorts of lies are best and wholesomest to be indulged, seeing we must all lie and do all lie, and what sorts it may be best to avoid, and this is a thing which I feel I can confidently put into the hands of this experienced club, a ripe body, who may be termed, in this regard, and without undue flattery, old masters. Alonzo Fitz and Other Stories by Mark Twain Chapter 3 About Magnanimous Incident Literature All my life, from boyhood up, I have had the habit of reading a certain set of anecdotes written in the quaint vein of the world's ingenious fabulist, for the lesson they taught me and the pleasure they gave me. They lay always convenient to my hand, and whenever I thought meanly of my kind I turned to them, and they banished that sentiment. Whenever I felt myself to be selfish, sordid, and ignoble, I turned to them and they told me what to do to win back my self-respect. 
many times i wished that the charming anecdotes had not stopped with their happy climaxes but had continued the pleasing history of the several benefactors and beneficiaries this wish rose in my breast so persistently that at last i determined to satisfy it by seeking out the sequels of those anecdotes myself so i set about it and after great labor and tedious research accomplished my task i will lay the result before you giving you each anecdote in its turn and following it with its sequel as i gathered it through my investigations the grateful poodle one day a benevolent physician who had read the books having found a stray poodle suffering from a broken leg conveyed the poor creature to his home and after setting and bandaging the injured limb gave the little outcast its liberty again and thought no more about the matter but how great was his surprise upon opening his door one morning some days later to find the grateful poodle patiently waiting there and in its company another stray dog one of whose legs by some accident had been broken the kind physician at once relieved the distressed animal nor did he forget to admire the inscrutable goodness and mercy of god who had been willing to use so humble an instrument as the poor outcast poodle for its inculcating of etc 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 sequel the next morning the benevolent physician found the two dogs beaming with gratitude waiting at his door and with them two other dogs cripples the cripples were speedily healed and the four went their way leaving the benevolent physician more overcome by pious wonder than ever the day passed the morning came there at the door sat now the four reconstructed dogs and with them four others requiring reconstruction this day also passed and another morning came and now sixteen dogs eight of them newly crippled occupied the sidewalk and the people were going around by noon the broken legs were all set but the pious wonder in the good physician's breast was beginning to get mixed with involuntary profanity the sun rose once more and exhibited thirty-two dogs sixteen of them with broken legs occupying the sidewalk and half of the street the human spectators took up the rest of the room the cries of the wounded the songs of the healed brutes and the comments of the onlooking citizens made great and inspiring cheer but traffic was interrupted in that street the good physician hired a couple of assistant surgeons and got through his benevolent work before dark first taking the precaution to cancel his church membership so that he might express himself with the latitude which the case required but some things have their limits when once more the morning dawned and the good physician looked out upon a massed and far-reaching multitude of clamorous and beseeching dogs he said i might as well acknowledge it i have been fooled by the books they only tell the pretty part of the story and then stop fetch me the shotgun this thing has gone along far enough he issued forth with his weapon and chanced to step upon the tail of the original poodle who promptly bit him in the leg now the great and good work which this poodle had been engaged in had engendered in him such a mighty and augmenting enthusiasm as to turn his weak head at last and drive him mad a month later when the benevolent physician lay in the death throes of hydrophobia he called his weeping friends about him and said beware of the books they tell but half of the story whenever a poor wretch asks you for help and you feel a doubt as to what result may flow from your benevolence give yourself the benefit of the doubt and kill the applicant and so saying he turned his face to the wall and gave up the ghost the benevolent author a poor and young literary beginner had tried in vain to get his manuscript accepted at last when the horrors of starvation were staring him in the face he laid his sad case before a celebrated author beseeching his counsel and assistance this generous man immediately put aside his own matters and proceeded to peruse one of the despised manuscripts having completed his kindly task he shook the poor young man cordially by the hand saying i perceive merit in this come again to me on monday 
at the time specified the celebrated author with a sweet smile but saying nothing spread open a magazine which was damp from the press what was the poor young man's astonishment to discover upon the printed page his own article how can i ever said he falling upon his knees and bursting into tears testify my gratitude for this noble conduct the celebrated author was the renowned snodgrass the poor young beginner thus rescued from obscurity and starvation was the afterward equally renowned snagsby let this pleasing incident admonish us to turn a charitable ear to all beginners that need help sequel the next week snagsby was back with five rejected manuscripts the celebrated author was a little surprised because in the books the young struggler had needed but one lift apparently however he ploughed through these papers removing unnecessary flowers and digging up some acres of adjective stumps and then succeeded in getting two of the articles accepted a week or so drifted by and the grateful snagsby arrived with another cargo the celebrated author had felt a mighty glow of satisfaction within himself the first time he had successfully befriended the poor young struggler and had compared himself with the generous people in the books with high gratification but he was beginning to suspect now that he had struck upon something fresh in the noble episode line his enthusiasm took a chill still he could not bear to repulse this struggling young author who clung to him with such pretty simplicity and truthfulness well the upshot of it all was that the celebrated author presently found himself permanently freighted with the poor young beginner all his mild efforts to unload this cargo went for nothing he had to give daily counsel daily encouragement he had to keep on procuring magazine acceptances and then revamping the manuscripts to make them presentable when the young aspirant got a start at last he rode into sudden fame by describing the celebrated author's private life with such a caustic humor and such minuteness of blistering detail that the book sold a prodigious edition and broke the celebrated author's heart with mortification with his latest gasp he said alas the books deceived me they do not tell the whole story beware of the struggling young author my friends whom god sees fit to starve let not man presumptuously rescue to his own undoing the grateful husband one day a lady was driving through the principal street of a great city with her little boy when the horses took fright and dashed madly away hurling the coachman from his box and leaving the occupants of the carnage paralyzed with terror but a brave youth who was driving a grocery wagon threw himself before the plunging animals and succeeded in arresting their flight at the peril of his own this is probably a misprint m t the grateful lady took his number and upon arriving at her home she related the heroic act to her husband who had read the books who listened with streaming eyes to the moving recital and who after returning thanks in conjunction with his restored loved ones to him who suffereth not even a sparrow to fall to the ground unnoticed sent for the brave young person and placing a check for five hundred dollars in his hand said take this as a reward for your noble act william ferguson and if ever you shall need a friend remember that thompson mcspadden has a grateful heart let us learn from this that a good deed cannot fail to benefit the doer however humble he may be sequel william ferguson called the next week and asked mr mcspadden to use his influence to get him a higher employment he feeling capable of better things than driving a grocer's wagon Mr. McSpadden got him an under-clerkship at a good salary. Presently William Ferguson's mother fell ill, and William—well, to cut the story short, Mr. McSpadden consented to take her into his house. Before long she yearned for the society of her younger children, so Mary and Julia were admitted also, and little Jimmy their brother. Jimmy had a pocket-knife and he wandered into the drawing-room with it one day alone and reduced ten thousand dollars worth of furniture to an indeterminable value in rather less than three-quarters of an hour a day or two later he fell downstairs and broke his neck and seventeen of his family's relatives came to the house to attend the funeral 
This made them acquainted, and they kept the kitchen occupied after that, and likewise kept the McSpaddens busy hunting up situations of various sorts for them, and hunting up more when they wore these out. The old woman drank a good deal, and swore a good deal, but the grateful McSpaddens knew it was their duty to reform her, considering what her son had done for them, so they clave nobly to their generous task. William came often and got decreasing sums of money, and asked for higher and more lucrative employments, which the grateful McSpadden more or less promptly procured for him. McSpadden consented also, after some demur, to fit William for college, but when the first vacation came and the hero requested to be sent to Europe for his health, the persecuted McSpadden rose against the tyrant and revolted. He plainly and squarely refused. William Ferguson's mother was so astounded that she let her gin-bottle drop, and her profane lips refused to do their office. When she recovered, she said in a half-gasp, "'Is this your gratitude? Where would your wife and boy be now but for my son?' William said, "'Is this your gratitude? Did I save your wife's life or not? Tell me that.' Seven relations swarmed in from the kitchen, and each said, and this is his gratitude. William's sisters stared, bewildered, and said, And this is his grat, but were interrupted by their mother, who burst into tears and exclaimed, To think that my sainted little Jimmy threw away his life in the service of such a reptile! Then the pluck of the revolutionary McSpadden rose to the occasion, and he replied with fervor, Out of my house, the whole beggarly tribe of you! I was beguiled by the books, but shall never be beguiled again. Once is sufficient for me. And turning to William, he shouted, Yes, you did save my wife's life, and the next man that does it shall die in his tracks. Not being a clergyman, I place my text at the end of my sermon instead of at the beginning. Here it is, from Mr. Noah Brooks' Recollections of President Lincoln, in Scribner's Monthly. J. H. Hackett, in his part of Falstaff, was an actor who gave Mr. Lincoln great delight. With his usual desire to signify to others his sense of obligation, Mr. Lincoln wrote a genial little note to the actor expressing his pleasure at witnessing his performance. Mr. Hackett, in reply, sent a book of some sort. Perhaps it was one of his own authorship. He also wrote several notes to the President. One night, quite late, when the episode had passed out of my mind, I went to the White House in answer to a message. Passing into the President's office, I noticed, to my surprise, Hackett sitting in the anteroom, as if waiting for an audience. The President asked me if anyone was outside. On being told, he said, half sadly, "'Oh, I can't see him, I can't see him. I was in hopes he had gone away.' Then he added, now, this just illustrates the difficulty of using pleasant friends and acquaintances in this place. You know how I liked Hackett as an actor, and how I wrote to tell him so. He sent me that book, and there I thought the matter would end. He is a master of his place in the profession, I suppose, and well fixed in it. But just because we had a little friendly correspondence, such as any two men might have, he wants something. What do you suppose he wants? I could not guess, and Mr. Lincoln added, Well, he wants to be consul to London. Oh, dear! I will observe in conclusion that the William Ferguson incident occurred, and within my personal knowledge, though I have changed the nature of the details to keep William from recognizing himself in it. All the readers of this article have, in some sweet and gushing hour of their lives, played the role of magnanimous incident hero. I wish I knew how many there are among them who are willing to talk about that episode, and like to be reminded of the consequences that flowed from it. Alonzo Fitz and Other Stories by Mark Twain Chapter 4 Punch, Brothers, Punch Will the reader please to cast his eye over the following lines, and see if he can discover anything harmful in them? Conductor, when you receive a fare, punch in the presence of the passenger. 
a blue trip slip for an eight cent fare a buff trip slip for a six cent fare a pink trip slip for a three cent fare punch in the presence of the passenger chorus punch brothers punch with care punch in the presence of the passenger i came across these jingling rhymes in a newspaper a little while ago and read them a couple of times they took instant and entire possession of me all through breakfast they went waltzing through my brain and when at last i rolled up my napkin i could not tell whether i had eaten anything or not i had carefully laid out my day's work the day before thrilling tragedy in the novel which i am writing i went to my den to begin my deed of blood i took up my pen but all i could get it to say was punch in the presence of the passenger i fought hard for an hour but it was useless my head kept humming a blue trip slip for an eight-cent fare a buff trip slip for a six-cent fare and so on and so on without peace or respite the day's work was ruined i could see that plainly enough i gave up and drifted downtown and presently discovered that my feet were keeping time to that relentless jingle when i could stand it no longer i altered my step but it did no good those rhymes accommodated themselves to the new step and went on harassing me just as before i returned home and suffered all the afternoon suffered all through an unconscious and unrefreshing dinner suffered and cried and jingled all through the evening went to bed and rolled tossed and jingled right along the same as ever got up at midnight frantic and tried to read but there was nothing visible upon the whirling page except punch punch in the presence of the passenger by sunrise i was out of my mind and everybody marveled and was distressed at the idiotic burden of my ravings punch oh punch punch in the presence of the passenger two days later on saturday morning i arose a tottering wreck and went forth to fulfill an engagement with a valued friend the rev mr blank 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 to walk to the talcott tower ten miles distant he stared at me but asked no questions we started mr blank 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 talked 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 as is his wont i said nothing i heard nothing at the end of a mile mr blank 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 said mark are you sick i never saw a man look so haggard and worn and absent-minded say something do drearily without enthusiasm i said punch brothers punch with care punch in the presence of the passenger my friend eyed me blankly looked perplexed then said i do not think i get your drift mark there does not seem to be any relevancy in what you have said certainly nothing sad and yet maybe it was the way you said the words i never heard anything that sounded so pathetic what is but i heard no more i was already far away with my pitiless heart-breaking blue trip slip for an eight-cent fare buff trip slip for a six-cent fare pink trip slip for a three-cent fare punch in the presence of the passenger i do not know what occurred during the other nine miles however all of a sudden mr blank 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 laid his hand on my shoulder and shouted oh wake up wake up wake up don't sleep all day here we are at the tower man i have talked myself deaf and dumb and blind and never got a response just look at this magnificent autumn landscape look at it look at it feast your eye on it you have traveled you have seen boasted landscapes elsewhere come now deliver an honest opinion what do you say to this i sighed wearily and murmured a buff trip slip for a six-cent fare a pink trip slip for a three-cent fare punch in the presence of the passenger rev mr blank 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 stood there very grave full of concern apparently and looked long at me then he said mark there is something about this that i cannot understand those are about the same words you said before there does not seem to be anything in them and yet they nearly break my heart when you say them punch in the uh, how is it they go i began at the beginning and repeated all the lines 
My friend's face lighted with interest. He said, Why, what a captivating jingle it is! It is almost music. It flows along so nicely, I have nearly caught the rhymes myself. Say them over just once more, and then I'll have them sure. I said them over. Then Mr. Blank 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 said them. He made one little mistake, which I corrected. The next time and the next he got them right. Now a great burden seemed to tumble from my shoulders. That torturing jingle departed out of my brain, and a grateful sense of rest and peace descended upon me. I was light-hearted enough to sing, and I did sing for half an hour, straight along, as we went jogging homeward. Then my freed tongue found blessed speech again, and the pent talk of many a weary hour began to gush and flow. It flowed on and on joyously, jubilantly, until the fountain was empty and dry. As I wrung my friend's hand at parting, I said, "'Haven't we had a royal good time? But now I remember you haven't said a word for two hours. Come, come, out with something!' The Reverend Mr. Blank 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 turned a lackluster eye upon me, drew a deep sigh, and said, without animation, without apparent consciousness, "'Punch, brothers, punch with care, punch in the presence of the passenger!' A pang shot through me as I said to myself, "'Poor fellow, poor fellow, he has got it now!' I did not see Mr. Blank 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 for two or three days after that. Then on Tuesday evening he staggered into my presence and sank dejectedly into a seat. He was pale, worn. He was a wreck. He lifted his faded eyes to my face and said, "'Ah, Mark, it was a ruinous investment that I made in those heartless rhymes. They have ridden me like a nightmare, day and night, hour after hour, to this very moment. Since I saw you, I have suffered the torments of the lost. Saturday evening I had a sudden call by telegraph and took the night train for Boston. The occasion was the death of a valued old friend, who had requested that I should preach his funeral sermon. I took my seat in the cars and set myself to framing the discourse, but I never got beyond the opening paragraph, for then the train started and the car wheels began their clack, 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 and right away those odious rhymes fitted themselves to that accompaniment. For an hour I sat there and set a syllable of those rhymes to every separate and distinct clack the car wheels made. Why, I was as fagged out then as if I had been chopping wood all day. My skull was splitting with headache. It seemed to me that I must go mad if I sat there any longer. So I undressed and went to bed. I stretched myself out in my berth, and, well, you know what the result was. The thing went right along just the same. Clack, 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 a blue trip slip. Clack, 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 for an eight-cent fare. Clack, 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 a buff trip slip. Clack, 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 for a six-cent fare. And so on, and so on, and so on, punch in the presence of the passenger. Sleep? <laughs> Not a single wink. I was almost a lunatic when I got to Boston. Don't ask me about the funeral. I did the best I could, but every solemn individual sentence was meshed and tangled and woven in and out with punch, brothers, punch with care, punch in the presence of the passenger. And the most distressing thing was that my delivery dropped into the undulating rhythm of those pulsing rhymes and I could actually catch absent-minded people nodding time to the swing of it with their stupid heads. And, Mark, you may believe it or not, but before I got through the entire assemblage were placidly bobbing their heads in solemn unison, mourners, undertaker, and all. The moment I had finished I fled to the ante-room, in a state bordering on frenzy. Of course, it would be my luck to find a sorrowing and aged maiden aunt of the deceased there, who had arrived from Springfield too late to get into the church. She began to sob and said, "'Oh, oh, he is gone, he is gone, and I didn't see him before he died.' "'Yes,' I said, "'he is gone, he is gone, he is gone. Oh, will this suffering never cease? You loved him, then? Oh, you two loved him.' "'Loved him? Loved who?' "'Why, 
my poor george my poor nephew oh him yeah yes oh yes yes certainly certainly punch punch oh this misery will kill me bless you bless you sir for these sweet words i too suffer in this dear loss were you present during his last moments yes i uh, whose last moments his the dear departed's yes oh yes 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 i suppose so i think so i don't know oh certainly i, I was there i was there oh what a privilege what a precious privilege and his last words oh tell me tell me his last words what did he say he said he said oh my head my head my head he said he said he never said anything but punch 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 in the presence of the passenger oh leave me madam in the name of all that is generous leave me to my madness my misery my despair a buff trip slip for a six cent fare a pink trip slip for a three cent fare endure rents can no further go punch in the presence of the passenger my friend's hopeless eyes rested upon mine a pregnant minute and then he said impressively mark you do not say anything you do not offer me any hope but ah me it is just as well it is just as well you could not do me any good the time has long gone by when words could comfort me something tells me that my tongue is doomed to wag forever to the jigger of that remorseless jingle there there it is coming on me again a blue trip slip for an eight cent fare a buff trip slip for thus murmuring faint and fainter my friend sank into a peaceful trance and forgot his sufferings in a blessed respite how did i finally save him from an asylum i took him to a neighboring university and made him discharge the burden of his persecuting rhymes into the eager ears of the poor unthinking students how is it with them now the result is too sad to tell why did i write this article it was for a worthy even a noble purpose it was to warn you reader if you should come across those merciless rhymes to avoid them avoid them as you would a pestilence alonzo fitz and other stories by mark twain chapter five the great revolution in pitcairn let me refresh the reader's memory a little nearly a hundred years ago the crew of the british ship bounty mutinied set the captain and his officers adrift upon the open sea took possession of the ship and sailed southward they procured wives for themselves among the natives of tahiti then proceeded to a lonely little rock in mid-pacific called pitcairn's island wrecked the vessel stripped her of everything that might be useful to a new colony and established themselves on shore pitcairns is so far removed from the track of commerce that it was many years before another vessel touched there it had always been considered an uninhabited island so when a ship did at last drop its anchor there in eighteen o eight the captain was greatly surprised to find the place peopled although the mutineers had fought among themselves and gradually killed each other off until only two or three of the original stock remained these tragedies had not occurred before a number of children had been born so in eighteen o eight the island had a population of twenty-seven persons john adams the chief mutineer still survived and was to live many years yet as governor and patriarch of the flock from being mutineer and homicide he had turned christian and teacher and his nation of twenty-seven persons was now the purest and devoutest in christendom adams had long ago hoisted the british flag and constituted his island as an appanage of the british crown Today the population numbers ninety persons sixteen men nineteen women twenty-five boys and thirty girls all descendants of the mutineers all bearing the family names of those mutineers and all speaking english and english only the island stands high up out of the sea and has precipitous walls it is about three-quarters of a mile long and in places is as much as half a mile wide 
such arable land as it affords is held by the several families according to a division made many years ago there is some livestock goats pigs chickens and cats but no dogs and no large animals there is one church building used also as a capital a schoolhouse and a public library the title of the governor has been for a generation or two magistrate and chief ruler in subordination to her majesty the queen of great britain it was his province to make the laws as well as execute them his office was elective everybody over seventeen years old had a vote no matter about the sex the sole occupations of the people were farming and fishing their sole recreation religious services there has never been a shop in the island nor any money the habits and dress of the people have always been primitive and their laws simple to puerility they have lived in a deep sabbath tranquillity far from the world and its ambitions and vexations and neither knowing nor caring what was going on in the mighty empires that lie beyond their limitless ocean solitudes once in three or four years a ship touched there moved them with aged news of bloody battles devastating epidemics fallen thrones and ruined dynasties then traded them some soap and flannel for some yams and breadfruit and sailed away leaving them to retire into their peaceful dreams and pious dissipations once more on the eighth of last september admiral de horsey commander-in-chief of the british fleet in the pacific visited pitcairn's island and speaks as follows in his official report to the admiralty they have beans carrots turnips cabbages and a little maize pineapples fig trees custard apples and oranges lemons and coconuts clothing is obtained alone from passing ships in barter for refreshments there are no springs on the island but as it rains generally once a month they have plenty of water although at times in former years they have suffered from drought no alcoholic liquors except for medicinal purposes are used and a drunkard is unknown the necessary articles required by the islanders are best shown by those we furnished in barter for refreshments namely flannel serge drill half-boots combs tobacco and soap they also stand much in need of maps and slates for their school and tools of any kind are most acceptable i caused them to be supplied from the public stores with a union jack for display on the arrival of ships and a pit saw of which they were greatly in need this i trust will meet the approval of their lordships if the municipal people of england were only aware of the wants of this most deserving little colony they would not long go unsupplied divine service is held every sunday at ten thirty a m and at three p m in the house built and used by john adams for that purpose until he died in eighteen twenty nine it is conducted strictly in accordance with the liturgy of the church of england by mr simon young their selected pastor who is much respected a bible class is held every wednesday when all who conveniently can attend there is also a general meeting for prayer on the first friday in every month family prayers are said in every house the first thing in the morning and the last thing in the evening and no food is partaken of without asking god's blessing before and afterward of these islanders religious attributes no one can speak without deep respect a people whose greatest pleasure and privilege is to commune in prayer with their god and to join in hymns of praise and who are moreover cheerful diligent and probably freer from vice than any other community need no priest among them now i come to a sentence in the admiral's report which he dropped carelessly from his pen no doubt and never gave the matter a second thought he little imagined what a freight of tragic prophecy it bore this is the sentence one stranger an american has settled on the island a doubtful acquisition a doubtful acquisition indeed captain ormsby in the american ship hornet touched at pitcairns nearly four months after the admiral's visit and from the facts which he gathered there we now know all about that american let us put these facts together in historical form the american's name was butterworth staveley as soon as he had become well acquainted with all the people and this took but a few days of course 
he began to ingratiate himself with them by all the arts he could command. He became exceedingly popular and much looked up to, for one of the first things he did was to forsake his worldly way of life and throw all his energies into religion. He was always reading his Bible, or praying, or singing hymns, or asking blessings. In prayer no one had such liberty as he, no one could pray so long or so well. At last, when he considered the time to be ripe, he began secretly to sow the seeds of discontent among the people. It was his deliberate purpose, from the beginning, to subvert the government, but of course he kept that to himself for a time. He used different arts with different individuals. He awakened dissatisfaction in one quarter by calling attention to the shortness of the Sunday services. He argued that there should be three three-hour services on Sunday instead of only two. Many had secretly held this opinion before. They now privately banded themselves into a party to work for it. He showed certain of the women that they were not allowed sufficient voice in the prayer meetings. Thus another party was formed. No weapon was beneath his notice. He even descended to the children, and awoke discontent in their breasts, because, as he discovered for them, they had not enough Sunday school. This created a third party. Now, as the chief of these parties, he found himself the strongest power in the community. So he proceeded to his next move, a no less important one than the impeachment of the chief magistrate, James Russell Nicoy, a man of character and ability, and possessed of great wealth, he being the owner of a house with a parlor to it, three acres and a half of yam land, and the only boat in Pitcairns, a whale-boat, and, most unfortunately, a pretext for this impeachment offered itself at just the right time. One of the earliest and most precious laws of the island was the law against trespass. It was held in great reverence, and was regarded as the palladium of the people's liberties. About thirty years ago an important case came before the courts under this law, in this wise. A chicken belonging to Elizabeth Young, aged at that time fifty-eight, a daughter of John Mills, one of the mutineers of the bounty, trespassed upon the grounds of Thursday October Christian, aged twenty-nine, a grandson of Fletcher Christian, one of the mutineers. Christian killed the chicken. According to the law, Christian could keep the chicken, or, if he preferred, he could restore its remains to the owner and receive damages in produce to an amount equivalent to the waste and injury wrought by the trespasser. The court records set forth that the said Christian aforesaid did deliver the aforesaid remains to the said Elizabeth Young, and did demand one bushel of yams in satisfaction of the damage done. But Elizabeth Young considered the demand exorbitant. The parties could not agree. Therefore Christian brought suit in the courts. He lost his case in the justice's court. At least, he was awarded only a half a peck of yams, which he considered insufficient, and in the nature of a defeat. He appealed. The case lingered several years in an ascending grade of courts, and always resulted in decrees sustaining the original verdict, and finally the thing got into the Supreme Court, and there it stuck for twenty years. But last summer even the Supreme Court managed to arrive at a decision at last. Once more the original verdict was sustained. Christian then said he was satisfied, but Stavely was present, and whispered to him and to his lawyer, suggesting as a mere form, that the original law be exhibited, in order to make sure that it still existed. It seemed an odd idea, but an ingenious one, so the demand was made. A messenger was sent to the magistrate's house. He presently returned with the tidings that it had disappeared from among the state archives. The court now pronounced its late decision void, since it had been made under a law which had no actual existence. Great excitement ensued immediately. The news swept abroad over the whole island that the palladium of the public liberties was lost, maybe treasonably destroyed. Within thirty minutes almost the entire nation were in the courtroom, that is to say, the church. The impeachment of the chief magistrate followed, upon Stavely's motion. The accused met his misfortune with the dignity which became his great office. He did not plead or even argue. He offered the simple defense that he had not meddled with the missing law, 
that he had kept the state archives in the same candle-box that had been used as their depository from the beginning and that he was innocent of the removal or destruction of the lost document but nothing could save him he was found guilty of misprision of treason and degraded from his office and all his property was confiscated the lamest part of the whole shameful matter was the reason suggested by his enemies for his destruction of the law to wit that he did it to favor christian because christian was his cousin whereas staveley was the only individual in the entire nation who was not his cousin the reader must remember that all these people are the descendants of half a dozen men that the first children intermarried together and bore grandchildren to the mutineers that these grandchildren intermarried after them great and great great grandchildren intermarried so that today everybody is blood kin to everybody moreover the relationships are wonderfully even astoundingly mixed up and complicated a stranger for instance says to an islander you speak of that young woman as your cousin a while ago you called her your aunt well she is my aunt and my cousin too and also my stepsister my niece my fourth cousin my thirty-third cousin my forty-second cousin my great-aunt my grandmother my widowed sister-in-law and next week she will be my wife so the charge of nepotism against the chief magistrate was weak but no matter weak or strong it suited staveley staveley was immediately elected to the vacant magistracy and oozing reform from every pore he went vigorously to work in no long time religious services raged everywhere and unceasingly by command the second prayer of the sunday morning service which had customarily endured some thirty-five or forty minutes and had pleaded for the world first by continent and then by national and tribal detail was extended to an hour and a half and made to include supplications in behalf of the possible peoples in the several planets everybody was pleased with this everybody said now this is something like by command the usual three-hour sermons were doubled in length the nation came in a body to testify their gratitude to the new magistrate the old law forbidding cooking on the sabbath was extended to the prohibition of eating also by command sunday school was privileged to spread over into the week the joy of all classes was complete in one short month the new magistrate had become the people's idol the time was ripe for this man's next move he began cautiously at first to poison the public mind against england he took the chief citizens aside one by one and conversed with them on this topic presently he grew bolder and spoke out he said the nation owed it to itself to its honor to its great traditions to rise in its might and throw off this galling english yoke but the simple islanders answered we had not noticed that it galled how does it gall england sends a ship once in three or four years to give us soap and clothing and things which we sorely need and gratefully receive she never troubles us she lets us go our own way she lets you go your own way so slaves have felt and spoken in all the ages this speech shows how fallen you are how base how brutalized you have become under this grinding tyranny what has all manly pride forsaken you is liberty nothing are you content to be a mere appendage to a foreign and hateful sovereignty when you might rise up and take your rightful place in the august family of nations great free enlightened independent the minion of no sceptred master but the arbiter of your own destiny and a voice and a power in decreeing the destinies of your sister sovereignties of the world speeches like this produced an effect by and by citizens began to feel the english yoke they did not know exactly how or whereabouts they felt it but they were perfectly certain they did feel it they got to grumbling a good deal and chafing under their chains and longing for relief and release they presently fell to hating the english flag that sign and symbol of their nation's degradation they ceased to glance up at it as they passed the capital but averted their eyes and grated their teeth and one morning when it was found trampled into the mud at the foot of the staff they left it there 
and no man put his hand to it to hoist it again. A certain thing which was sure to happen sooner or later happened now. Some of the chief citizens went to the magistrate by night, and said, We can endure this hated tyranny no longer. How can we cast it off? By a coup d'etat. How? A coup d'etat. It is like this. Everything is got ready, and at the appointed moment, I, as the official head of the nation, publicly and solemnly proclaim its independence, and absolve it from allegiance to any and all other powers whatsoever. Well, that sounds simple and easy. We can do that right away. Then what will be the next thing to do? Seize all the defenses and public properties of all kinds, establish martial law, put the army and navy on a war footing, and proclaim the empire. This fine program dazzled these innocents. They said, this is grand this is splendid but will not england resist let her this rock is a gibraltar true but what about the empire do we need an empire and an emperor what you need my friends is unification look at germany look at italy they are unified unification is the thing it makes living dear that constitutes progress we must have a standing army and a navy. Taxes follow as a matter of course. All these things summed up make grandeur. With unification and grandeur, what more can you want? Very well. Only the Empire can confer these boons. So on the eighth day of December, Pitcairn's Island was proclaimed a free and independent nation, and on the same day the solemn coronation of Butterworth I, Emperor of Pitcairn's Island, took place amid great rejoicings and festivities. The entire nation, with the exception of fourteen persons, mainly little children, marched past the throne in single file, with banners and music, the procession being upward of ninety feet long, and some said it was as much as three-quarters of a minute passing a given point. Nothing like it had ever been seen in the history of the island before. Public enthusiasm was measureless. Now straightway imperial reforms began. Orders of nobility were instituted. A minister of the navy was appointed, and the whaleboat put in commission. A minister of war was created, and ordered to proceed at once with the formation of a standing army. A first lord of the treasury was named, and commanded to get up a taxation scheme, and also open negotiations for treaties, offensive, defensive, and commercial, with foreign powers. Some generals and admirals were appointed, also some chamberlains, some equerries in waiting, and some lords of the bedchamber. At this point all the material was used up. The Grand Duke of Galilee, Minister of War, complained that all the sixteen grown men in the empire had been given great offices, and consequently would not consent to serve in the ranks, wherefore his standing army was at a standstill. The Marquis of Ararat, Minister of the Navy, made a similar complaint. He said he was willing to steer the whaleboat himself, but he must have somebody to man her. The emperor did the best he could in the circumstances. He took all the boys above the age of ten years away from their mothers, and pressed them into the army, thus constructing a corps of seventeen privates, officered by one lieutenant-general and two major-generals. This pleased the minister of war, but procured the enmity of all the mothers in the land for they said their precious ones must now find bloody graves in the fields of war, and he would be answerable for it. Some of the more heartbroken and unappeasable among them lay constantly wait for the emperor, and threw yams at him, unmindful of the bodyguard. On account of the extreme scarcity of material, it was found necessary to require the Duke of Bethany, postmaster-general, to pull stroke-oar in the navy, and thus sit in the rear of a noble of lower degree, namely Viscount Canaan, Lord Justice of the Common Pleas. This turned the Duke of Bethany into tolerably open malcontent and a secret conspirator, a thing which the Emperor foresaw, but could not help. Things went from bad to worse. The emperor raised Nancy Peters to the peerage on one day, and married her the next, notwithstanding, for reasons of state, the cabinet had strenuously advised him to marry Emmeline, eldest daughter of the Archbishop of Bethlehem. This caused trouble in a powerful quarter, the church. 
the new empress secured the support and friendship of two-thirds of the thirty-six grown women in the nation by absorbing them into her court as maids of honor but this made deadly enemies of the remaining twelve the families of the maids of honor soon began to rebel because there was nobody at home to keep house the twelve snubbed women refused to enter the imperial kitchen as servants so the empress had to require the countess of jericho and other great court dames to fetch water sweep the palace and perform other menial and equally distasteful services this made bad blood in that department everybody fell to complaining that the taxes levied for the support of the army the navy and the rest of the imperial establishment were intolerably burdensome and were reducing the nation to beggary the emperor's reply look look at germany look at italy are you better than they and haven't you unification did not satisfy them they said people can't eat unification and we are starving agriculture has ceased everybody is in the army everybody is in the navy everybody is in the public service standing around in a uniform with nothing whatever to do nothing to eat and nobody to till the fields look at germany look at italy it is the same there such is unification and there's no other way to get it no other way to keep it after you've got it said the poor emperor always but the grumblers only replied we can't stand the taxes we can't stand them now right on top of this the cabinet reported a national debt amounting to upward of forty-five dollars half a dollar to every individual in the nation and they proposed to fund something they had heard that this was always done in such emergencies they proposed duties on exports also on imports and they wanted to issue bonds also paper money redeemable in yams and cabbages in fifty years they said the pay of the army and of the navy and of the whole government machine was far in arrears and unless something was done and done immediately national bankruptcy must ensue and possibly insurrection and revolution the emperor at once resolved upon a high-handed measure and one of a nature never before heard of in pitcairn's island he went in state to the church on sunday morning with the army at his back and commanded the minister of the treasury to take up a collection that was the feather that broke the camel's back first one citizen and then another rose and refused to submit to this unheard-of outrage and each refusal was followed by the immediate confiscation of the malcontents property this vigor soon stopped the refusals and the collection proceeded amid a sullen and ominous silence as the emperor withdrew with the troops he said i will teach you who is master here several persons shouted down with unification they were at once arrested and torn from the arms of their weeping friends by the soldiery but in the meantime as any prophet might have foreseen a social democrat had been developed as the emperor stepped into the gilded imperial wheelbarrow at the church door the social democrat stabbed at him fifteen or sixteen times with a harpoon but fortunately with such a peculiarly social democratic unprecision of aim as to do no damage that very night the convulsion came the nation rose as one man though forty-nine of the revolutionists were of the other sex the infantry threw down their pitchforks the artillery cast aside their coconuts the navy revolted the emperor was seized and bound hand and foot in his palace he was very much depressed he said i freed you from a grinding tyranny i lifted you out of your degradation and made you a nation among nations i gave you a strong compact centralized government and more than all i gave you the blessing of blessings unification i have done all this and my reward is hatred insult and these bonds take me do with me as you will i here resign my crown and all my dignities and gladly do i release myself from their too heavy burden for your sake i took them up for your sake i lay them down the imperial jewel is no more now bruise and defile as ye will the useless setting by a unanimous voice the people condemned the ex-emperor and the social democrat to perpetual banishment from church services 
or to perpetual labor as galley-slaves in the whaleboat, whichever they might prefer. The next day the nation assembled again, and re-hoisted the British flag, reinstated the British tyranny, reduced the nobility to the condition of commoners again, and then straightway turned their diligent attention to the weeding of the ruined and neglected yam-patches, and the rehabilitation of the old useful industries, and the old healing and solacing pieties. The ex-emperor restored the lost trespass law, and explained that he had stolen it not to injure any one, but to further his political projects. Therefore the nation gave the late chief magistrate his office again, and also his alienated property. Upon reflection, the ex-emperor and the social democrat chose perpetual banishment from religious services, in preference to perpetual labor as galley-slaves with perpetual religious services, as they phrased it. Wherefore, the people believed that the poor fellows' troubles had unseated their reason, and so they judged it best to confine them for the present, which they did. Such is the history of Pitcairn's doubtful acquisition. Alonzo Fitz and Other Stories by Mark Twain Chapter 6 The Canvasser's Tale Poor sad-eyed stranger! There was that about his humble mien, his tired look, his decayed gentility of clothes, that almost reached the mustard-seed of charity that still remained, remote and lonely, in the empty vastness of my heart, notwithstanding I observed a portfolio under his arm, and said to myself, Behold, Providence hath delivered his servant into the hands of another canvasser. Well, these people always get one interested. Before I well knew how it came about, this one was telling me his history, and I was all attention and sympathy. He told it something like this. My parents died, alas, when I was a little sinless child. My uncle Ithuriel took me to his heart and reared me as his own. He was my only relative in the wide world. But he was good and rich and generous. He reared me in the lap of luxury. I knew no want that money could satisfy. In the fullness of time I was graduated and went with two of my servants, my chamberlain and my valet, to travel in foreign countries. During four years I flitted upon careless wing amid the beauteous gardens of the distant strand, if you will permit this form of speech in one whose tongue was ever attuned to poesy. And indeed I so speak with confidence, as one unto his kind, for I perceive by your eyes that you too, sir, are gifted with the divine inflation. In those far lands I reveled in the ambrosial food that fructifies the soul, the mind, the heart. But of all things, that which most appealed to my inborn aesthetic taste was the prevailing custom there, among the rich, of making collections of elegant and costly rarities, dainty objets de vertu, and in an evil hour I tried to uplift my uncle Ithuriel to a plane of sympathy with this exquisite employment. I wrote and told him of one gentleman's vast collection of shells, another's noble collection of meerschaum pipes, another elevating and refining collection of undecipherable autographs, another's priceless collection of old china, another's enchanting collection of postage stamps, and so forth and so on. Soon my letters yielded fruit. My uncle began to look about for something to make a collection of. You may know, perhaps, how fleetly a taste like this dilates. His soon became a raging fever, though I knew it not. He began to neglect his great pork business. Presently he wholly retired, and turned an elegant leisure into a rabid search for curious things. His wealth was vast, and he spared it not. First he tried cowbells. He made a collection which filled five large salons, and comprehended all the different sorts of cowbells that ever had been contrived, save one. That one, an antique, and the only specimen extant, was possessed by another collector. My uncle offered enormous sums for it, but the gentleman would not sell. Doubtless you know what necessarily resulted. A true collector attaches no value to a collection that is not complete. His great heart breaks, he sells his hoard, he turns his mind to some field that seems unoccupied. 
thus did my uncle he next tried brickbats after piling up a vast and intensely interesting collection the former difficulty supervened his great heart broke again he sold out his soul's idol to the retired brewer who possessed the missing brick then he tried flint hatchets and other implements of primeval man but by and by discovered that the factory where they were made was supplying other collectors as well as himself he tried aztec inscriptions and stuffed whales another failure after incredible labor and expense when his collection seemed at last perfect a stuffed whale arrived from greenland and an aztec inscription from the cundurango region of central america that made all former specimens insignificant my uncle hastened to secure these noble gems he got the stuffed whale but another collector got the inscription a real cundurango as possibly you know is a possession of such supreme value when once a collector gets it he will rather part with his family than with it so my uncle sold out and saw his darlings go forth never more to return and his coal-black hair turned white as snow in a single night now he waited and thought he knew another disappointment might kill him he was resolved that he would choose things next time that no other man was collecting he carefully made up his mind and once more entered the field this time to make a collection of echoes of what said i echoes sir his first purchase was an echo in georgia that repeated four times his next was a six repeater in maryland his next was a thirteen repeater in maine his next was a nine repeater in kansas his next was a twelve repeater in tennessee which he got cheap so to speak because it was out of repair a portion of the crag which reflected it having tumbled down he believed he could repair it at a cost of a few thousand dollars and by increasing the elevation with masonry treble the repeating capacity but the architects who undertook the job had never built an echo before and so he utterly spoiled this one before he meddled with it it used to talk back like a mother-in-law but now it was only fit for the deaf and dumb asylum well next he bought a lot of cheap little double-barreled echoes scattered around over various states and territories he got them at twenty per cent off by taking the lot next he bought a perfect gatling gun of an echo in oregon and it cost a fortune i can tell you you may know sir that in the echo market the scale of prices is cumulative like the carat scale in diamonds in fact the same phraseology is used a single carat echo is worth but ten dollars over and above the value of the land it is on a two carat or double barreled echo is worth thirty dollars a five carat is worth nine hundred and fifty a ten carat is worth thirteen thousand my uncle's oregon echo which he called the great pit echo was a twenty-two carat gem and cost two hundred and sixteen thousand dollars they threw the land in for it was four hundred miles from a settlement well in the meantime my path was a path of roses i was the accepted suitor of the only and lovely daughter of an english earl and was beloved to distraction in that dear presence i swam in seas of bliss the family were content for it was known that i was sole heir to an uncle held to be worth five millions of dollars however none of us knew that my uncle had become a collector at least in anything more than a small way for aesthetic amusement now gathered the clouds above my unconscious head that divine echo since known throughout the world as the great kurinur or mountain of repetitions was discovered it was a sixty-five carat gem you could utter a word and it would talk back at you for fifteen minutes when the day was otherwise quiet but behold another fact came to light at the same time another echo collector was in the field the two rushed to make the peerless purchase the property consisted of a couple of small hills with a shallow swale between out yonder among the back settlements of new york state both men arrived on the ground at the same time and neither knew the other was there the echo was not all owned by one man 
a person by the name of williamson bolivar jarvis owned the east hill and a person by the name of harbison j bledsoe owned the west hill the swale between was the dividing line so while my uncle was buying jarvis's hill for three million two hundred and eighty five thousand dollars the other party was buying bledsoe's hill for a shade over three million now do you perceive the natural result why the noblest collection of echoes on earth was forever and ever incomplete since it possessed but the one half of the king echo of the universe neither man was content with this divided ownership yet neither would sell to the other there were jawings bickerings heart-burnings and at last that other collector with a malignity which only a collector can ever feel toward a man and a brother proceeded to cut down his hill you see as long as he could not have the echo he was resolved that nobody should have it he would remove his hill and then there would be nothing to reflect my uncle's echo my uncle remonstrated with him but the man said i own one end of this echo i choose to kill my end you must take care of your own end yourself well my uncle got an injunction put on him the other man appealed and fought it in a higher court they carried it on up clear to the supreme court of the united states it made no end of trouble there two of the judges believed that an echo was personal property because it was impalpable to sight and touch and yet was purchasable saleable and consequently taxable two others believed that an echo was real estate because it was manifestly attached to the land and was not removable from place to place other of the judges contended that an echo was not property at all it was finally decided that the echo was property that the hills were property that the two men were separate and independent owners of the two hills but tenants in common in the echo therefore defendant was at full liberty to cut down his hill since it belonged solely to him but must give bonds in three million dollars as indemnity for damages which might result to my uncle's half of the echo this decision also debarred my uncle from using defendant's hill to reflect his part of the echo without defendant's consent he must use only his own hill if his part of the echo would not go under these circumstances it was sad of course but the court could find no remedy the court also debarred defendant from using my uncle's hill to reflect his end of the echo without consent you see the grand result neither man would give consent and so that astonishing and most noble echo had to cease from its great powers and since that day that magnificent property is tied up and unsaleable a week before my wedding day while i was still swimming in bliss and the nobility were gathering from far and near to honor our espousals came news of my uncle's death and also a copy of his will making me his sole heir he was gone alas my dear benefactor was no more the thought surcharges my heart even at this remote day i handed the will to the earl i could not read it for the blinding tears the earl read it then he sternly said sir do you call this wealth but doubtless you do in your inflated country sir you are left sole heir to a vast collection of echoes if a thing can be called a collection that is scattered far and wide over the huge length and breadth of the american continent sir this is not all you are head and ears in debt there is not an echo in the lot but has a mortgage on it sir i am not a hard man but i must look to my child's interest if you had but one echo which you could honestly call your own if you had but one echo which was free from encumbrance so that you could retire to it with my child and by humble painstaking industry cultivate and improve it and thus wrest from it a maintenance i would not say you nay but i cannot marry my child to a beggar leave his side my darling go sir take your mortgage-ridden echoes and quit my sight for ever my noble celestine clung to me in tears with loving arms and swore she would willingly nay gladly marry me though i had not an echo in the world but it could not be we were torn asunder she to pine and die within the twelvemonth 
i to toil life's long journey sad and alone praying daily hourly for that release which shall join us together again in that dear realm where the wicked cease from troubling and the weary are at rest now sir if you will be so kind as to look at these maps and plans in my portfolio i am sure i can sell you an echo for less money than any man in the trade now this one which cost my uncle ten dollars thirty years ago and is one of the sweetest things in texas i will let you have it for let me interrupt you i said my friend i have not had a moment's respite from canvassers this day i have bought a sewing machine which i did not want i have bought a map which is mistaken in all its details i have bought a clock which will not go i have bought a moth poison which the moths prefer to any other beverage i have bought no end of useless inventions and now i have had enough of this foolishness i would not have one of your echoes if you were even to give it to me i would not let it stay on the place i always hate a man that tries to sell me echoes you see this gun now take your collection and move on let us not have bloodshed but he only smiled a sad sweet smile and got out some more diagrams you know the result perfectly well because you know that when you have once opened the door to a canvasser the trouble is done and you have got to suffer defeat i compromised with this man at the end of an intolerable hour i bought two double-barreled echoes in good condition and he threw in another which he said was not saleable because it only spoke german he said she was a perfect polyglot once but somehow her palate got down alonzo fitz and other stories by mark twain chapter seven an encounter with an interviewer the nervous dapper pert young man took the chair i offered him and said he was connected with the daily thunderstorm and added hoping it's no harm i've come to interview you come to what interview you ah i see yes yes hmm. yes yes i was not feeling bright that morning indeed my powers seemed a bit under a cloud however i went to the bookcase and when i had been looking six or seven minutes i found i was obliged to refer to the young man i said how do you spell it spell what interview oh my goodness what do you want to spell it for i don't want to spell it i want to see what it means well this is astonishing i must say i can tell you what it means if you if you oh all right that will answer and much obliged to you too in in ter ter inter then you spell it with an i why certainly oh that is what took me so long why my dear sir what did you propose to spell it with well i i i hardly know i had the unabridged and i was suffering around in the back end hoping i might tree her among the pictures but it's a very old edition why my friend they wouldn't have a picture of it in even the latest it my dear sir i beg your pardon i mean no harm in the world but you do not look as as intelligent as i had expected you would no harm i i mean no harm at all oh don't mention it it has often been said and by people who would not flatter and who could have no inducement to flatter that i am quite remarkable in that way yes yes they always speak of it with rapture i can easily imagine it but about this interview you know it is the custom now to interview any man who has become notorious indeed i had not heard of it before it must be very interesting what do you do it with ah well 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 this is disheartening it ought to be done with a club in some cases but customarily it consists in the interviewer asking questions and the interviewed answering them it is all the rage now will you let me ask you certain questions calculated to bring out the salient points of your public and private history oh with pleasure with pleasure i have a very bad memory but i hope you will not mind that that is to say it is an irregular memory singularly irregular sometimes it goes in a gallop and then again it will be as much as a fortnight passing a given point this is a great grief to me oh it is no matter so you will try to do the best you can 
I will. I will put my whole mind on it. Thanks. Are you ready to begin? Ready. Question. How old are you? Answer. Nineteen in June. Question. Indeed. I would have taken you to be thirty-five or six. Where were you born? Answer. In Missouri. Question. When did you begin to write? Answer. In 1836. Question. Why, how could that be, if you are only nineteen now? Answer. I don't know. It does seem curious, somehow. Question. It does, indeed. Whom do you consider the most remarkable man you ever met? Answer. Aaron Burr. Question. But you never could have met Aaron Burr, if you were only nineteen years. Answer. Now, if you know more about me than I do, what do you ask me for? Question. Well, it was only a suggestion, nothing more. How did you happen to meet Burr? Answer. Well, I happened to be at his funeral one day, and he asked me to make less noise, and— Question. But, good heavens! If you were at his funeral, he must have been dead. And if he was dead, how could he care whether you made a noise or not? Answer. I don't know. He was always a particular kind of a man that way. Question. Still, I don't understand it at all. You say he spoke to you and that he was dead. Answer. I didn't say he was dead. Question. But wasn't he dead? Answer. Well, some said he was, some said he wasn't. Question. What did you think? Answer. Oh, it was none of my business. It wasn't any of my funeral. Question. Did you— However, we can never get this matter straight. Let me ask about something else. What was the date of your birth? Answer. Monday, October 31st, 1693. Question. What? Impossible. That would make you a hundred and eighty years old. How do you account for that? Answer. I don't account for it at all. Question. But you said at first you were only nineteen, and now you make yourself out to be one hundred and eighty. It is an awful discrepancy. Answer. Why, have you noticed that? Shaking hands. Many a time it has seemed to me like a discrepancy, but somehow I couldn't make up my mind. How quick you notice a thing. Question. Thank you for the compliment, as far as it goes. Had you, or have you, any brothers or sisters? Answer. Eh, I... I... I think so, yes, uh, but I don't remember. Question. Well, that is the most extraordinary statement I ever heard. Answer. Why, what makes you think that? Question. How could I think otherwise? Why, look here. Who is this a picture of on the wall? Isn't that a brother of yours? Answer. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, now you remind me of it. Uh, that was a brother of mine. That's William. Bill, we called him. Poor old Bill. Question. Why? Is he dead, then? Answer. Ah, well, I suppose so. We never could tell. There was a great mystery about it. Question. That is sad, very sad. He disappeared, then? Answer. Well, yes, in a sort of general way. We buried him. Question. Buried him? Buried him without knowing whether he was dead or not? Answer. Oh, no, not that. He was dead enough. Question. Well, I confess I can't understand this. If you buried him, and you knew he was dead, I answer. No, no, we only thought he was. Question. Oh, I see. He came to life again? Answer. I bet he didn't. Question. Well, I never heard anything like this. Somebody was dead. Somebody was buried. Now, where was the mystery? Answer. Ah, that's just it. That's it exactly. You see, we were twins, defunct and I, and we got mixed in the bathtub when we were only two weeks old, and one of us was drowned. But we didn't know which. Some think it was Bill, some think it was me. Question. Well, that is remarkable. What do you think? Answer. Goodness knows. I would give whole worlds to know. This solemn, this awful mystery has cast a gloom over my whole life. But I will tell you a secret now, which I never have revealed to any creature before. One of us had a peculiar mark, a large mole on the back of his left hand. That was me. That child was the one that was drowned. Question. 
very well then i don't see that there is any mystery about it after all answer you don't well i do anyway i don't see how they could ever have been such a blundering lot as to go and bury the wrong child but sh don't mention it where the family can hear of it heaven knows they have heart-breaking troubles enough without adding this question well i believe i have got material enough for the present and i am very much obliged to you for the pains you have taken but i was a good deal interested in that account of aaron burr's funeral would you mind telling me what particular circumstance it was that made you think burr was such a remarkable man answer oh it was a mere trifle not one man in fifty would have noticed it at all when the sermon was over and the procession all ready to start for the cemetery and the body all arranged nice in the hearse he said he wanted to take a last look at the scenery and so he got up and rode with the driver then the young man reverently withdrew he was very pleasant company and i was sorry to see him go alonzo fitz and other stories by mark twain chapter eight paris notes crowded out of a tramp abroad to make room for more vital statistics m t the parisian travels but little he knows no language but his own reads no literature but his own and consequently he is pretty narrow and pretty self-sufficient however let us not be too sweeping there are frenchmen who know languages not their own these are the waiters among the rest they know english that is they know it on the european plan which is to say they can speak it but can't understand it they easily make themselves understood but it is next to impossible to word an english sentence in such a way as to enable them to comprehend it they think they comprehend it they pretend they do but they don't here is a conversation which i had with one of these beings i wrote it down at the time in order to have it exactly correct I, these are fine oranges where are they grown he more yes i will bring them i no uh, do not bring any more i only want to know where they are from where they are raised he yes with imperturbable mien and rising inflection i yes can you tell me what country they are from he yes blandly with rising inflection i disheartened they are very nice he good night bows and retires quite satisfied with himself that young man could have become a good english scholar by taking the right sort of pains but he was french and wouldn't do that how different is the case with our people they utilize every means that offers there are some alleged french protestants in paris and they built a nice little church on one of the great avenues that lead away from the arch of triumph and proposed to listen to the correct thing preached in the correct way there in their precious french tongue and be happy but their little game does not succeed our people are always there ahead of them sundays and take up all the room when the minister gets up to preach he finds his house full of devout foreigners each ready and waiting with his little book in his hand a morocco-bound testament apparently but only apparently it is mr bellows admirable and exhaustive little french-english dictionary which in look and binding and size is just like a testament and those people are there to study french the building has been nicknamed the church of the gratis french lesson these students probably acquire more language than general information for i am told that a french sermon is like a french speech it never names a historical event but only the date of it if you are not up in dates you get left a french speech is something like this comrades citizens brothers noble parts of the only sublime and perfect nation let us not forget that the twenty first january cast off our chains that the tenth august relieved us of the shameful presence of foreign spies that the fifth september was its own justification before heaven and humanity that the eighteenth brumaire contained the seeds of its own punishment 
that the fourteenth july was the mighty voice of liberty proclaiming the resurrection the new day and inviting the oppressed peoples of the earth to look upon the divine face of france and live and let us here record our everlasting curse against the man of the second december and declare in thunder tones the native tones of france that but for him there had been no seventeenth march in history no twelfth october no nineteenth january no twenty second april no sixteenth november no thirtieth september no second july no fourteenth february no twenty ninth june no fifteenth august no thirty first may that but for him france the pure the grand the peerless had had a serene and vacant almanac to-day i have heard of one french sermon which closed in this odd yet eloquent way my hearers we have sad cause to remember the man of the thirteenth january the results of the vast crime of the thirteenth january have been in just proportion to the magnitude of the set itself but for it there had been no thirty november sorrowful spectacle the grisly deed of the sixteenth june had not been done but for it nor had the man of the sixteenth june known existence to it alone the third september was due also the fatal twelfth october shall we then be grateful for the thirteenth january with its freight of death for you and me and all that breathe yes my friends for it gave us also that which had never come but for it and it alone the blessed twenty-fifth december it may be well enough to explain though in the case of many of my readers this will hardly be necessary the man of the thirteenth january is adam the crime of that date was the eating of the apple the sorrowful spectacle of the thirtieth november was the expulsion from eden the grisly deed of the sixteenth june was the murder of abel the act of the third september was the beginning of the journey to the land of nod the twelfth day of october the last mountain-tops disappeared under the flood when you go to church in france you want to take your almanac with you annotated alonzo fitz and other stories by mark twain chapter nine legend of sagenfeld in germany left out of a tramp abroad because its authenticity seemed doubtful and could not at that time be proved m t one more than a thousand years ago this small district was a kingdom a little bit of a kingdom a sort of dainty little toy kingdom as one might say it was far removed from the jealousies strifes and turmoils of that old warlike day and so its life was a simple life its people a gentle and guileless race it lay always in a deep dream of peace a soft sabbath tranquillity there was no malice there was no envy there was no ambition consequently there were no heart-burnings there was no unhappiness in the land in the course of time the old king died and his little son hubert came to the throne the people's love for him grew daily he was so good and so pure and so noble that by and by his love became a passion almost a worship now at his birth the soothsayers had diligently studied the stars and found something written in that shining book to this effect in hubert's fourteenth year a pregnant event will happen the animal whose singing shall sound sweetest in hubert's ear shall save hubert's life so long as the king and the nation shall honor this animal's race for this good deed the ancient dynasty shall not fail of an heir nor the nation know war or pestilence or poverty but beware an erring choice all through the king's thirteenth year but one thing was talked of by the soothsayers the statesmen the little parliament and the general people that one thing was this how is the last sentence of the prophecy to be understood what goes before seems to mean that the saving animal will choose itself at the proper time 
but the closing sentence seems to mean that the king must choose beforehand and say what singer among the animals pleases him best and that if he choose wisely the chosen animal will save his life his dynasty his people but that if he should make an erring choice beware by the end of the year there were as many opinions about this matter as there had been in the beginning but a majority of the wise and the simple were agreed that the safest plan would be for the little king to make choice beforehand and the earlier the better so an edict was sent forth commanding all persons who owned singing creatures to bring them to the great hall of the palace in the morning of the first day of the new year this command was obeyed when everything was in readiness for the trial the king made his solemn entry with the great officers of the crown all clothed in their robes of state the king mounted his golden throne and prepared to give judgment but he presently said these creatures all sing at once the noise is unendurable no one can choose in such a turmoil take them all away and bring back one at a time this was done one sweet warbler after another charmed the young king's ear and was removed to make way for another candidate the precious minutes slipped by among so many bewitching songsters he found it hard to choose and all the harder because the promised penalty for an error was so terrible that it unsettled his judgment and made him afraid to trust his own ears he grew nervous and his face showed distress his ministers saw this for they never took their eyes from him a moment now they began to say in their hearts he has lost courage the cool head is gone he will err he and his dynasty and his people are doomed at the end of an hour the king sat silent a while and then said bring back the linnet the linnet trilled forth her jubilant music in the midst of it the king was about to uplift his sceptre in sign of choice but checked himself and said but let us be sure bring back the thrush let them sing together the thrush was brought and the two birds poured out their marvels of song together the king wavered then his inclination began to settle and strengthen one could see it in his countenance hope budded in the hearts of the old ministers their pulses began to beat quicker the sceptre began to rise slowly when there was a hideous interruption it was a sound like this just at the door <coughs> <coughs> everybody was sorely startled and enraged at himself for showing it the next instant the dearest sweetest prettiest little peasant maid of nine years came tripping in her brown eyes glowing with childish eagerness but when she saw that august company and those angry faces she stopped and hung her head and put her poor coarse apron to her eyes nobody gave her welcome none pitied her Presently she looked up timidly through her tears, and said, "'My lord the king, I pray you pardon me, for I meant no wrong. I have no father and no mother, but I have a goat and a donkey, and they are all in all to me. My goat gives me the sweetest milk, and when my dear good donkey brays, it seems to me there is no music like to it.' so when my lord the king's jester said the sweetest singer among all the animals should save the crown and nation and moved me to bring him here all the court burst into a rude laugh and the child fled away crying without trying to finish her speech the chief minister gave a private order that she and her disastrous donkey be flogged beyond the precincts of the palace and commanded to come within them no more then the trial of the birds was resumed the two birds sang their best, but the sceptre lay motionless in the king's hand. Hope died slowly out in the breasts of all. An hour went by, two hours, still no decision. The day waned to its close, and the waiting multitudes outside the palace grew crazed with anxiety and apprehension. The twilight came on, the shadows fell deeper and deeper. The king and his court could no longer see each other's faces. No one spoke none called for lights the great trial had been made it had failed each and all wished to hide their faces from the light and cover up their deep trouble in their own hearts 
finally hark a rich full strain of the divinest melody streamed forth from a remote part of the hall the nightingale's voice up shouted the king let all the bells make proclamation to the people for the choice is made and we have not erred king dynasty and nation are saved from henceforth let the nightingale be honored throughout the land forever and publish it among all the people that whosoever shall insult a nightingale or injure it shall suffer death the king hath spoken all that little world was drunk with joy the castle and the city blazed with bonfires all night long the people danced and drank and sang and the triumphant clamor of the bells never ceased from that day the nightingale was a sacred bird its song was heard in every house the poets wrote its praises the painters painted it its sculptured image adorned every arch and turret and fountain and public building it was even taken into the king's councils and no grave matter of state was decided until the soothsayers had laid the thing before the state nightingale and translated to the ministry what it was that the bird had sung about it two the young king was very fond of the chase when the summer was come he rode forth with hawk and hound one day in a brilliant company of his nobles he got separated from them by and by in a great forest and took what he imagined a near cut to find them again but it was a mistake he rode on and on hopefully at first but with sinking courage finally twilight came on and still he was plunging through a lonely and unknown land then came a catastrophe in the dim light he forced his horse through a tangled thicket overhanging a steep and rocky declivity when horse and rider reached the bottom the former had a broken neck and the latter a broken leg the poor little king lay there suffering agonies of pain and each hour seemed a long month to him he kept his ear strained to hear any sound that might promise hope of rescue but he heard no voice no sound of horn or bay of hound so at last he gave up all hope and said let death come for come it must just then the deep sweet song of a nightingale swept across the still wastes of the night saved the king said saved it is the sacred bird and the prophecy is come true the gods themselves protected me from error in the choice he could hardly contain his joy he could not word his gratitude every few moments now he thought he caught the sound of approaching succor but each time it was a disappointment no succor came the dull hours drifted on still no help came but still the sacred bird sang on he began to have misgivings about his choice but he stifled them toward dawn the bird ceased the morning came and with it thirst and hunger but no succor the day waxed and waned at last the king cursed the nightingale immediately the song of the thrush came from out the wood the king said in his heart this was the true bird my choice was false succor will come now but it did not come then he lay many hours insensible when he came to himself a linnet was singing he listened with apathy his faith was gone these birds he said can bring no help i and my house and my people are doomed he turned him about to die for he was grown very feeble from hunger and thirst and suffering and felt that his end was near in truth he wanted to die and be released from pain for long hours he lay without thought or feeling or motion then his senses returned the dawn of the third morning was breaking ah the world seemed very beautiful to those worn eyes suddenly a great longing to live rose up in the lad's heart and from his soul welled a deep and fervent prayer that heaven would have mercy upon him and let him see his home and his friends once more in that instant a soft a faint a far-off sound but oh how inexpressibly sweet to his waiting ear came floating out of the distance <coughs> that oh 
that song is sweeter a thousand times sweeter than the voice of the nightingale thrush or linnet for it brings not mere hope but certainty of succor and now indeed am i saved the sacred singer has chosen itself as the oracle intended the prophecy is fulfilled and my life my house and my people are redeemed the ass shall be sacred from this day the divine music grew nearer and nearer stronger and stronger and ever sweeter and sweeter to the perishing sufferer's ear down the declivity the docile little donkey wandered cropping herbage and singing as he went and when at last he saw the dead horse and the wounded king he came and snuffed at them with simple and marvelling curiosity the king petted him and he knelt down as had been his wont when his little mistress desired to mount with great labor and pain the lad drew himself upon the creature's back and held himself there by aid of the generous ears the ass went singing forth from the place and carried the king to the little peasant maid's hut she gave him her pallet for a bed refreshed him with goat's milk and then flew to tell the great news to the first scouting party of searchers she might meet the king got well his first act was to proclaim the sacredness and the inviolability of the ass his second was to add this particular ass to his cabinet and make him chief minister of the crown his third was to have all the statues and effigies of nightingales throughout his kingdom destroyed and replaced by statues and effigies of the sacred donkey and his fourth was to announce that when the little peasant maid should reach her fifteenth year he would make her his queen and he kept his word such is the legend this explains why the mouldering image of the ass adorns all these old crumbling walls and arches and it explains why during many centuries an ass was always the chief minister in that royal cabinet just as is still the case in most cabinets to this day and it also explains why in that little kingdom during many centuries all great poems all great speeches all great books all public solemnities and all royal proclamations always began with these stirring words <coughs> alonzo fitz and other stories by mark twain chapter ten speech on the babies at the banquet in chicago given by the army of the tennessee to their first commander general u s grant november eighteen seventy nine the fifteenth regular toast was the babies as they comfort us in our sorrows let us not forget them in our festivities i like that we have not all had the good fortune to be ladies we have not all been generals or poets or statesmen but when the toast works down to the babies we stand on common ground it is a shame that for a thousand years the world's banquets have utterly ignored the baby as if he didn't amount to anything if you will stop and think a minute if you will go back fifty or one hundred years to your early married life and recontemplate your first baby you will remember that he amounted to a great deal and even something over you soldiers all know that when the little fellow arrived at family headquarters you had to hand in your resignation he took entire command you became his lackey his mere body servant and you had to stand around too he was not a commander who made allowances for time distance weather or anything else you had to execute his order whether it was possible or not and there was only one form of marching in his manual of tactics and that was the double quick he treated you with every sort of insolence and disrespect and the bravest of you didn't dare to say a word you could face the death storm at donelson and vicksburg and give back blow for blow but when he clawed your whiskers and pulled your hair and twisted your nose you had to take it when the thunders of war were sounding in your ears you set your faces toward the batteries and advanced with steady tread but when he turned on the terrors of his war-whoop you advanced in the other direction 
and mighty glad of the chance too when he called for soothing syrup did you venture to throw out any side remarks about certain services being unbecoming an officer and a gentleman no you got up and got it when he ordered his pap bottle and it was not warm did you talk back not you you went to work and warmed it you even descended so far in your menial office as to take a suck at that warm insipid stuff yourself to see if it was right three parts water to one of milk a touch of sugar to modify the colic and a drop of peppermint to kill those hiccups i can taste that stuff yet and how many things you learned as you went along sentimental young folks still take stock in that beautiful old saying that when the baby smiles in his sleep it is because the angels are whispering to him very pretty but too thin simply wind on the stomach my friends if the baby proposed to take a walk at his usual hour two o'clock in the morning didn't you rise up promptly and remark with a mental addition which would not improve a sunday school book much that that was the very thing you were about to propose yourself oh you were under good discipline and as you went fluttering up and down the room in your undress uniform you not only prattled undignified baby talk but even turned up your martial voices and tried to sing rock-a-bye baby in the treetop for instance what a spectacle for an army of the tennessee and what an affliction for the neighbors too for it is not everybody within a mile around that likes military music at three in the morning and when you had been keeping this sort of thing up two or three hours and your little velvet head intimated that nothing suited him like exercise and noise what did you do go on you simply went on until you dropped in the last ditch the idea that a baby doesn't amount to anything why one baby is just a house and a front yard full by itself one baby can furnish more business than you and your whole interior department can attend to he is enterprising irrepressible brimful of lawless activities do what you please you can't make him stay on the reservation sufficient unto the day is one baby as long as you are in your right mind don't you ever pray for twins twins amount to a permanent riot and there ain't any real difference between triplets and an insurrection yes it was high time for a toastmaster to recognize the importance of the babies think what is in store for the present crop fifty years from now we shall all be dead i trust and then this flag if it still survive and let us hope it may will be floating over a republic numbering two hundred million souls according to the settled laws of our increase our present schooner of state will have grown into a political leviathan a great eastern the cradled babies of today will be on deck let them be well trained for we are going to leave a big contract on their hands among the three or four million cradles now rocking in the land are some which this nation would preserve for ages as sacred things if we could know which ones they are in one of these cradles the unconscious farragut of the future is at this moment teething think of it and putting in a world of dead earnest unarticulated but perfectly justifiable profanity over it too in another the future renowned astronomer is blinking at the shining milky way with but a languid interest poor little chap and wondering what has become of that other one they call the wet nurse in another the future great historian is lying and doubtless will continue to lie until his earthly mission is ended in another the future president is busying himself with no profounder problem of state then what the mischief has become of his hair so early and in a mighty array of other cradles there are now some sixty thousand future office seekers getting ready to furnish him occasion to grapple with that same old problem a second time and in still one more cradle somewhere under the flag the future illustrious commander-in-chief of the american armies is so little burdened with his approaching grandeurs and responsibilities as to be giving his whole strategic mind at this moment to trying to find out some way to get his big toe into his mouth 
an achievement which, meaning no disrespect, the illustrious guest of this evening turned his entire attention to some fifty-six years ago, and, if the child is but a prophecy of the man, there are mighty few who will doubt that he succeeded. Alonzo Fitz and Other Stories by Mark Twain Chapter 11 Speech on the Weather at the New England Society's 71st Annual Dinner, New York City. The next toast was, The oldest inhabitant, the weather of New England. Who can lose it and forget it? Who can have it and regret it? Be interposer twixt us, Twain. Merchant of Venice. To this Samuel L. Clemens, Mark Twain, replied as follows. I reverently believe that the Maker, who made us all, makes everything in New England but the weather. I don't know who makes that, but I think it must be raw apprentices in the weather clerk's factory who experiment and learn how, in New England, for board and clothes, and then are promoted to make weather for countries that require a good article, and will take their custom elsewhere if they don't get it. There is a sumptuous variety about the New England weather that compels the stranger's admiration and regret. The weather is always doing something there, always attending strictly to business, always getting up new designs and trying them on the people to see how they will go. But it gets through more business in spring than in any other season. In the spring I have counted one hundred and thirty-six different kinds of weather inside of four and twenty hours. It was I that made the fame and fortune of that man that had that marvelous collection of weather on exhibition at the Centennial that so astounded the foreigners. He was going to travel all over the world and get specimens from all the climes. I said, "'Don't you do it! You come to New England on a favorable spring day.' I told him what we could do in the way of style, variety, and quantity. Well, he came, and he made his collection in four days. As to variety, why, he confessed that he got hundreds of kinds of weather that he had never heard of before. And as to quantity, well, after he had picked out and discarded all that was blemished in any way, he not only had weather enough, but weather to spare, weather to hire out, weather to sell, to deposit whether to invest, whether to give to the poor. The people of New England are by nature patient and forbearing, but there are some things which they will not stand. Every year they kill a lot of poets for writing about beautiful spring. These are generally casual visitors who bring their notions of spring from somewhere else, and cannot, of course, know how the natives feel about spring and so the first thing they know the opportunity to inquire how they feel has permanently gone by old probabilities has a mighty reputation for accurate prophecy and thoroughly well deserves it you take up the paper and observe how crisply and confidently he checks off what today's weather is going to be on the pacific down south in the middle states in the wisconsin region see him sail along in the joy and pride of his power till he gets to New England, and then see his tail drop. He doesn't know what the weather is going to be in New England. Well, he mulls over it, and by and by he gets out something about like this. Probable northeast to southwest winds, varying to the southward and westward and eastward, and points between. High and low barometers swapping around from place to place probable areas of rain, snow, hail, and drought, succeeded or preceded by earthquakes with thunder and lightning. Then he jots down this postscript from his wandering mind to cover accidents. But it is possible that the program may be wholly changed in the meantime. Yes, one of the brightest gems in the New England weather is the dazzling uncertainty of it. There is only one thing certain about it. You are certain there is going to be plenty of it. A perfect grand review. But you never can tell which end of the procession is going to move first. You fix up for the drought, you leave your umbrella in the house and sally out, and two to one you get drowned. You make up your mind that the earthquake is due, you stand from under and take hold of something to steady yourself, and the first thing you know you get struck by lightning. 
these are great disappointments but they can't be helped the lightning there is peculiar it is so convincing that when it strikes a thing it doesn't leave enough of that thing behind for you to tell whether well you'd think it was something valuable and a congressman had been there and the thunder when the thunder begins to merely tune up and scrape and saw and key up the instruments for the performance strangers say why what awful thunder you have here but when the baton is raised and the real concert begins you'll find that stranger down in the cellar with his head in the ash barrel now as to the size of the weather in new england lengthwise i mean it is utterly disproportioned to the size of that little country half the time when it is packed as full as it can stick you will see that new england weather sticking out beyond the edges and projecting around hundreds and hundreds of miles over the neighboring states she can't hold a tenth part of her weather you can see cracks all about where she has strained herself trying to do it i could speak volumes about the inhuman perversity of the new england weather but i will give but a single specimen i like to hear rain on a tin roof so i covered part of my roof with tin with an eye to that luxury well sir do you think it ever rains on that tin no sir skips it every time mind in this speech i have been trying merely to do honor to the new england weather no language could do it justice but after all there is at least one or two things about that weather or if you please effects produced by it which we residents would not like to part with if we hadn't our bewitching autumn foliage we should still have to credit the weather with one feature which compensates for all its bullying vagaries the ice storm when a leafless tree is clothed with ice from the bottom to the top ice that is as bright and clear as crystal when every bough and twig is strung with ice beads frozen dewdrops and the whole tree sparkles cold and white like the shah of persia's diamond plume then the wind waves the branches and the sun comes out and turns all those myriads of beads and drops to prisms that glow and burn and flash with all manner of colored fires which change and change again with inconceivable rapidity from blue to red from red to green and green to gold the tree becomes a spraying fountain a very explosion of dazzling jewels and it stands there the acme the climax the supremest possibility in art or nature of bewildering intoxicating intolerable magnificence one cannot make the words too strong alonzo fitz and other stories by mark twain chapter twelve concerning the american language being part of a chapter which was crowded out of a tramp abroad m t there was an englishman in our compartment and he complimented me on on what uh, but you would never guess he complimented me on my english he said americans in general did not speak the english language as correctly as i did i said i was obliged to him for his compliment since i knew he meant it for one but that i was not fairly entitled to it for i did not speak english at all i only spoke american he laughed and said it was a distinction without a difference i said no the difference was not prodigious but still it was considerable we fell into a friendly dispute over the matter i put my case as well as i could and said the languages were identical several generations ago but our changed conditions and the spread of our people far to the south and far to the west have made many alterations in our pronunciation and have introduced new words among us and changed the meanings of many old ones english people talk through their noses we do not we say no english people say now we say cow the briton says cow we oh come that is pure yankee everybody knows that yes it is pure yankee that is true one cannot hear it in america outside of the little corner called new england which is yankee land the english themselves planted it there two hundred and fifty years ago and there it remains it has never spread but england talks through her nose yet 
the londoner and the backwoods new englander pronounce no and cow alike and then the briton unconsciously satirizes himself by making fun of the yankee's pronunciation we argued this point at some length nobody won but no matter the fact remains englishmen say now and cow for no and cow and that is what the rustic inhabitant of a very small section of america does you conferred your a upon new england too and there it remains it has not travelled out of the narrow limits of those six little states in all these two hundred and fifty years all england uses it new england's small population say four million use it but we have forty-five millions who do not use it you say gloss of wataw so does new england at least new england says gloss america at large flattens the a and says glass of water these sounds are pleasanter than yours you may think they are not right well in english they are not right but in american they are you say flask and basket and jackass we say flask basket jackass sounding the a as it is in tallow fallow and so on up to as late as eighteen forty seven mr webster's dictionary had the impudence to still pronounce basket basket when he knew that outside of his little new england all america shortened the a and paid no attention to his english broadening of it however it called itself an english dictionary so it was proper enough that it should stick to english forms perhaps it still calls itself an english dictionary to-day but it has quietly ceased to pronounce basket as if it were spelt basket in the american language the h is respected the h is not dropped or added improperly same is the case in england i mean among the educated classes of course yes that is true but a nation's language is a very large matter it is not simply a manner of speech obtaining among the educated handful the manner obtaining among the vast uneducated multitude must be considered also your uneducated masses speak english you will not deny that our uneducated masses speak american it won't be fair for you to deny that for you can see yourself that when your stable boy says it isn't the unting that hurts the horse but the amma 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 on the odd highway and our stable boy makes the same remark without suffocating a single h these two people are manifestly talking two different languages but if the signs are to be trusted even your educated classes used to drop the h they say humble now and heroic and historic etc but i judge that they used to drop those h's because your writers still keep up the fashion of putting an before those words instead of a this is what mr darwin might call a rudimentary sign that as an was justifiable once and useful when your educated classes used to say humble and heroic and historical correct writers of the american language do not put an before those words the english gentleman had something to say upon this matter but never mind what he said i'm not arguing his case i have him at a disadvantage now i proceeded in england you encourage an orator by exclaiming hear hear we pronounce it here in some sections here in others and so on but our whites do not say hear pronouncing the a's like the ah of ah i have heard english ladies say don't you making two separate and distinct words of it your mr burnham has satirized it but we always say don't you this is much better your ladies say oh it's awful nice ours say oh it's awful nice we say four hundred you say four as in the word or your clergymen speak of the lord ours of the lord yours speak of the gods of the heathen ours of the gods of the heathen when you are exhausted you say you are knocked up we don't when you say you will do a thing directly you mean immediately in the american language generally speaking the word signifies after a little when you say clever you mean capable 
with us the word used to mean accommodating but i don't know what it means now your word stout means fleshy our word stout usually means strong your words gentleman and lady have a very restricted meaning with us they include the barmaid butcher burglar harlot and horse thief you say i haven't got any stockings on i haven't got any memory i haven't got any money in my purse we usually say i haven't any stockings on i haven't any memory i haven't any money in my purse you say out of window we always put in a the if one asks how old is that man the briton answers he will be about forty in the american language we should say he is about forty however i won't tire you sir but if i wanted to i could pile up differences here until i not only convinced you that english and american are separate languages but that when i speak my native tongue in its utmost purity an englishman can't understand me at all i don't wish to flatter you but it is about all i can do to understand you now that was a very pretty compliment and it put us on the pleasantest terms directly i use the word in the english sense later eighteen eighty two aesthetes in many of our schools are now beginning to teach the pupils to broaden the a and to say don't you in the elegant foreign way alonzo fitz and other stories by mark twain chapter thirteen rogers this man rogers happened upon me and introduced himself at the town of blank 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 in the south of england where i stayed a while his stepfather had married a distant relative of mine who was afterward hanged and so he seemed to think a blood relationship existed between us he came in every day and sat down and talked of all the bland serene human curiosities i ever saw i think he was the chiefest he desired to look at my new chimney-pot hat i was very willing for i thought he would notice the name of the great oxford street hatter in it and respect me accordingly but he turned it about with a sort of grave compassion pointed out two or three blemishes and said that i being so recently arrived could not be expected to know where to supply myself said he would send me the address of his hatter then he said pardon me and proceeded to cut a neat circle of red tissue paper daintily notched the edges of it took the mucilage and pasted it in my hat so as to cover the manufacturer's name he said no one will know now where you got it i will send you a hat tip of my hatter and you can paste it over this tissue circle it was the calmest coolest thing i never admired a man so much in my life mind he did this while his own hat sat offensively near our noses on the table an ancient extinguisher of the slouch pattern limp and shapeless with age discolored by vicissitudes of the weather and banded by an equator of bear's grease that had stewed through another time he examined my coat i had no terrors for over my tailor's door was the legend by special appointment tailor to h r h the prince of wales etc i did not know at the time that the most of the tailor shops had the same sign out and that whereas it takes nine tailors to make an ordinary man it takes a hundred and fifty to make a prince he was full of compassion for my coat wrote down the address of his tailor for me did not tell me to mention my nom de plume and the tailor would put his best work on my garment as complimentary people sometimes do but said his tailor would hardly trouble himself for an unknown person unknown person when i thought i was so celebrated in england that was the cruelest cut but cautioned me to mention his name and it would be all right thinking to be facetious i said but he might sit up all night and injure his health well let him said rogers i've done enough for him for him to show some appreciation of it i might as well have tried to disconcert a mummy with my facetiousness said rogers i get all my coats there and they're the only coats fit to be seen in i made one more attempt i said i wish you had brought one with you i would like to look at it bless your heart haven't i got one on this article is morgan's make 
I examined it. The coat had been bought ready-made, of a Chatham Street Jew without any question, about 1848. It probably cost four dollars when it was new. It was ripped, it was frayed, it was napless and greasy. I could not resist showing him where it was ripped. It so affected him that I was almost sorry I had done it. First he seemed plunged into a bottomless abyss of grief, then he roused himself, made a feint with his hands as if waving off the pity of a nation, and said, with what seemed to me a manufactured emotion, "'No matter, no matter, don't mind me. Do not bother about it. I can get another.' When he was thoroughly restored, so that he could examine the rip and command his feelings, he said, "'Ah, now he understood it. His servant must have done it while dressing him that morning.' His servant. There was something awe-inspiring in effrontery like this. Nearly every day he interested himself in some article of my clothing. One would hardly have expected this sort of infatuation in a man who always wore the same suit, and it a suit that seemed coeval with the conquest. It was an unworthy ambition, perhaps, but I did wish I could make this man admire something about me, or something I did. You would have felt the same way. I saw my opportunity. I was about to return to London, and had listed my soiled linen for the wash. It made quite an imposing mountain in the corner of the room, fifty-four pieces. I hoped he would fancy it was the accumulation of a single week. I took up the wash-list, as if to see that it was all right, and then tossed it on the table with pretended forgetfulness. Sure enough, he took it up and ran his eye along down to the grand total. Then he said, "'You get off easy,' and laid it down again. His gloves were the saddest ruin, but he told me where I could get some like them. His shoes would hardly hold walnuts without leaking, but he liked to put his feet up on the mantelpiece and contemplate them. He wore a dim glass breastpin, which he called a morphilitic diamond, or whatever that may mean, and said only two of them had ever been found. The Emperor of China had the other one. Afterward, in London, it was a pleasure to me to see this fantastic vagabond come marching into the lobby of the hotel in his grand-ducal way, for he always had some new imaginary grandeur to develop. There was nothing stale about him but his clothes. If he addressed me when strangers were about, he always raised his voice a little and called me Sir Richard, or General, or Your Lordship and when people began to stare and look deferential, he would fall to inquiring in a casual way why I disappointed the Duke of Argyle the night before, and then remind me of our engagement at the Duke of Westminster's for the following day. I think that for the time being these things were realities to him. He once came and invited me to go with him and spend the evening with the Earl of Warwick at his town-house. I said I had received no formal invitation. He said that that was of no consequence. The Earl had no formalities for him or his friends. I asked if I could go just as I was. He said, no, that would hardly do. Evening dress was requisite at night in any gentleman's house. He said he would wait while I dressed, and then we would go to his apartment, and I could take a bottle of champagne and a cigar while he dressed. I was very willing to see how this enterprise would turn out. So I dressed, and we started to his lodgings. He said if I didn't mind we would walk. So we tramped some four miles through the mud and fog, and finally found his apartments. They consisted of a single room over a barber's shop in a back street. Two chairs, a small table, an ancient valise, a wash-basin and pitcher, both on the floor in a corner, an unmade bed, a fragment of a looking-glass, and a flower-pot with a perishing little rose geranium in it, which he called a century plant, and said it had not bloomed now for upward of two centuries, given to him by the late Lord Palmerston, been offered a prodigious sum for it. These were the contents of the room. Also a brass candlestick and a part of a candle. Rogers lit the candle and told me to sit down and make myself at home. He said he hoped I was thirsty, because he would surprise my palate with an article of champagne that seldom got into a commoner's system, or would I prefer sherry or port. 
said he had port in bottles that were swathed in stratified cobwebs every stratum representing a generation and as for his cigars well i should judge of them myself then he put his head out at the door and called sackville no answer hi sackville no answer now what the devil can have become of that butler i never allow a servant to oh confound that idiot he's got the keys can't get into the other rooms without the keys i was just wondering at his intrepidity and in still keeping up the delusion of the champagne and trying to imagine how he was going to get out of the difficulty now he stopped calling sackville and began to call anglesey but anglesey didn't come he said this is the second time that that equerry has been absent without leave to-morrow i'll discharge him now he began to whoop for thomas but thomas didn't answer then for theodore but no theodore replied well i give it up said rogers the servants never expect me at this hour and so they're all off on a lark might get along without the equerry and the page but can't have any wine or cigars without the butler and can't dress without my valet i offered to help him dress but he would not hear of it and besides he said he would not feel comfortable unless dressed by a practised hand however he finally concluded that he was such old friends with the earl that it would not make any difference how he was dressed so we took a cab he gave the driver some directions and we started by and by we stopped before a large house and got out i never had seen this man with a collar on he now stepped under a lamp and got a venerable paper collar out of his coat pocket along with a hoary cravat and put them on he ascended the stoop and entered presently he reappeared descended rapidly and said come quick we hurried away and turned the corner now we're safe he said and took off his collar and cravat and returned them to his pocket made a mighty narrow escape said he how said i to george the countess was there well what of that don't she know you know me absolutely worships me i just did happen to catch a glance of her before she saw me and out i shot haven't seen her for two months to rush in on her without any warning might have been fatal she could not have stood it i didn't know she was in town thought she was at the castle let me lean on you uh, just a moment there now i am better thank you thank you ever so much lord bless me what an escape so i never got to call on the earl after all but i marked the house for future reference it proved to be an ordinary family hotel with about a thousand plebeians roosting in it in most things rogers was by no means a fool in some things it was plain enough that he was a fool but he certainly did not know it he was in the deadest earnest in these matters he died at sea last summer as the earl of ramsgate end of chapter thirteen and end of alonzo fitz and other stories by mark twain